Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, today, we're going to continue hearing evidence from Dr. Colwell of the BRE. But before we do that, <coughs> I'd better to explain that uh, Ms. Istefan unfortunately tested positive for COVID yesterday evening. So she has remained at home and she'll follow the proceedings on the live stream. Uh, Mr. Akbor and I both have tested negative for COVID. So we're still here and uh, looking forward to the day's events. So that is why I'm afraid that we're one person short. Right, would you ask Dr. Colwell to come back in, please? Good morning, Dr. Colwell. Good morning. Now, if you're what you weren't here when I explained to everyone watching why we've got an empty chair in front of you, but just so that you know, I'm afraid Ms. Istefan tested positive for COVID okay. last night, so she is isolating and uh, she won't be here for this day and probably for a day or two. Um, but Mr. Akbor and I have both tested negative, so we're at the moment at least fairly safe. Okay. All right? Thank you. Yes, Ms. Green. Yes, thank you. Yes, good morning, Dr. Colwell. Good morning. Um, we were mid-topic and we were discussing Fire Note 9 when we broke off yesterday evening. Um, can we look at your witness statement, please? And I want to go to page 20, paragraph 129. And there you had been asked about discussions between the BRE and the department at any stage during the development of Fire Note 9. And your answer was... I'm not aware of the details of any discussions that took place, although I assume that they did take place with MHCLG, as the work would have been undertaken as part of a contract to provide a benchmarking classification. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and at paragraph 130, you're asked about these discussions, and you say, I would presume that it would have involved Tony Morris, Peter Field, and representatives from MHCLG. Now... Um, are you quite sure about that? Because you were the author of Fire Note 9, yes. Is it your evidence that you had no involvement at any time in discussions with the department about that document? I have no recollection of, in, in, the, in terms of developing why Fire Note 9 um, was published um, to replace Fire Note 3. With the passage of time, I'm sorry, I have no recollections to what that ha why that step was taken. I can, I can see from the documentary evidence what changes were made, and I can understand why those changes were made. But in terms of a conversation with the department or um, about the, the process by which that took place, I've gotten, I have no recollection of that. And, and as, as I say, my assumption would be that the department asked for it to be completed through uh, Tony and Peter, and I was asked to do it, and I did. Right, OK. Now, in July 2000, a revised edition of approved document B was published. Now, can you remember whether you saw a draft of that 2000 edition of approved document B before it was published? I have no recollection of seeing it, no. No. Um, were you aware at the time of the publication of that new edition of the, the approved document? Yes, I would have been aware that it had been published. Right. Let's go to that edition of the approved document. It's at CLG, here it is, 15012. And if we look, this is page 89, which is in section, at this time, it was section 13 that came, contained the guidance on external walls and B4. And if we look at paragraph 13.5 there on the left-hand side... We can see it tells us the external surfaces of walls should meet the provisions in diagram 40. And then it says, however, the total amount of combustible material may be limited in practice by the provisions for space separation in section 14. And then below that, it says this, note, one alternative to meeting the provisions in diagram 40 could be BRE fire note 9, assessing the fire performance of external cladding systems, a test method. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So we can see that Fire Note 9 was introduced into that edition of the approved document, not as a test that had to be complied with under that guidance, still less a substitute for the class naught requirement, as the select committee had recommended, but it was simply referenced as an alternative, yes? Yes, I can see that. Were you aware at any time before that edition was published in July 2000 that Fire Note 9 was not going to replace 
the testing to BS 476 Part 6 and Part 7, as recommended by Diagram 40 and National Class Nought, but that there would just be a passing mention of it in the text of the guidance as a possible alternative option? No. You weren't aware of that? No. As I say, my, my involvement in the drafting of the approved documents was, um, that, that was not an area I had any uh, direct contact with. Right. So was this a complete surprise to, to you that it was only there as a note rather than actually as the main route to compliance? My day-to-day -day work doesn't involve the approved document. So as such, the decisions that were made around the inclusion of um, test methods or exclusion of test methods in the approved document was something that was discussed by those who had a close working knowledge of the of the documentation. If it had not been included, then I would have assumed that there was consultation around that. That was my understanding of how approved documents were drafted and that would have been the consensus that right. had gone forward. So to, to have an opinion around that, I was... I was not party to the to the wider discussions to understand the context that those uh, statements were being made in. Right. I'm not sure that quite a answers my question. I understand you're saying you weren't involved in those decisions, but I'd, I'd like to understand your reaction. Were you surprised? You said you were aware of the Select Committee's recommendation that the, the, the full-scale test should substitute what was in there previously, i.e. Diagram 40 in Class Nord. Um, were you surprised when you realised that hadn't been implemented in that way? At that point, I don't think I had a. I don't think I had an opinion because I, I had presumed that whatever the the route that had been taken had been been addressed in in a way that had met those requirements of the recommendations. I, I apologise if I'm, if I'm not very clear with this, but as I say, the approved document wasn't a day-to-day -day working document, so in that sense, I'm not... Um, my, my relationship with it and my understanding of it was that those that were working with that and developing it and consulting on it, had taken on board what was asked of them, had consulted on that, and therefore this was a solution that had been right. returned. It wasn't something that I had a particular opinion around because I wasn't aware of the wider consultations or discussions that had taken place around it. Yes, I see. Do you know anything about why it came about that this was the way Fire Note 9 was written up into the approved document? I'm really sorry, I don't. As I say, I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not party in that in that sense to those those conversations. Did you still have an expectation that the full scale test might replace um, diagram forty at some point in the future? My my understanding was that diagram forty was there to enable systems that um, were not as um, as prescribed in the approved document um, would have a method to. Uh, uh, to be tested. Right, I see. Now, yesterday, um, when I was asking you about um, the approved document, you said that your understanding had been of the approved document, and we weren't clear exactly on, on when we were talking about, was that all materials in the external wall had to be of limited combustibility, and that the class naught reference and the reference to external services was just about the paint or the surface coating. Yes. Now, just looking at this version of approved document B, this is the 2000 version, so it's before the 2006 version that's published in 2007 that we'll come to. Um, what was your understanding about um, what needed to be of limited combustibility in the external wall? Because if we look on the right-hand side at 13.7, we can see it says the external envelope of a building should not be not should not provide a medium for fire spread if it's likely to be a risk to health or safety. The use of combustible materials for cladding framework 
or of combustible thermal insulation as an overcladding or in ventilated cavities may present such a risk in tall buildings, even though the provisions for external surfaces in diagram 40 may have been satisfied. And then it goes on. In a building with a story 18 metres or more above ground level, insulation material used in ventilated cavities in the external wall construction should be of limited combustibility. This restriction does not apply to masonry cavity wall construction. So that's how the approved document read at this time. What was your understanding about what materials had to be of limited combustibility at this point? I say I'm really sorry, but my I was not in a role interpreting the approved document. My I had worked to develop a method of test that enabled um, systems to be assessed and if a client came to us and asked us to test to that, we tested to it. It was not my role at any point, or BRE's role at any point, to, to interpret the approved document in terms of whether or not um, something needed to be um, addressed. It, it's, if somebody says, we need a Class O product, then they will come to us and we will test that product for Class O. We don't, we're not involved in interpreting where that should or shouldn't be used within an approved document. Right. Are you saying that no one at the BRE was in a role that uh, required interpreting the approved document? I wasn't working with anyone in that, in that arena, no. Right. OK. Now, can we go to the department's response to the committee's recommendations again, which is at CLG 140347? And I want to look at paragraph 9 on page 3. Um, Paragraph 9 explains that Fire Note 9 would be referenced as an alternative um, in the 2000 edition of the approved document, which would soon be coming into force. That's effectively what that paragraph says. And then if you look down at paragraph 11, it says this, when the technical amendments to the document have been completed and it has been adopted as a British standard, the department will amend the reference in the approved document to BRE Fire Note 9 to reflect its status as a British standard. We will also <coughs> review whether the reference to this method of demonstrating compliance should be strengthened. It is unlikely that any such changes will be made immediately. The status of the test method is changed as such minor amendments to the approved document are difficult to promulgate to ensure that all users of the document are made aware of the change. However, supplements to the approved document are planned to give guidance on the new harmonised European methods of test, and the amendment would be included in this. Now, were you aware of this part of the response from the department at the time? No. Is it, was it correct for the department to have said in April 2000 that technical amendments were being made to Fire Note 9? That's what it said in the, in the first few lines of that. As I said in my uh, statement and illustrated with the comparison uh, from uh, my the, the methodology remained un unchanged. So in terms of technical changes, they would be referencing those three revisions that were put in place. Right, I see. Were you aware in 2000 that the department had stated that it would review whether the reference to this method of demonstrating compliance should be strengthened? No. No. Can you help us on what that means, strengthening the reference to the, the method? No. You can't. Did there come a time over the years from 2000 onwards when you realised that the select committee's recommendation was not going to be followed and that the 8414 full-scale test series would not replace the provisions in diagram 40 of approved document B? Did there become a time when you became aware of that? I, c I can't put a, a date or a, a, a statement to it. I don't think I made the connection going forward that it, it hadn't in that form because, as I just said, the my understanding, my expectation was that that consultation as a result of the um, select committee um, announcement was that that had been the 
solution that had been presented and and offered. I've I've no way of understanding the whether that um, how select committee recommendations operate. Whether they go back and say you didn't do what we asked you to do. I don't know. Is that something that happens in practice? I'm I'm not familiar with that. Right. No, I'm just seeking to get to the bottom of whether you. Um, became aware and you realised at some point after this time that the select committee's recommendation that um, this full-scale test should substitute what was in the approved document was not going to be fulfilled. I, yeah, I, I guess it, it, in, in that 2000 edition it, it, it didn't and um, that sort of approach didn't alter after that? No. Okay, I want to turn to some questions now about the contract for the review of BR135 with the department, for which the BRE bid in late 1999, following the fire at Garnet Court and the Select Committee inquiry. That became something known as the review of fire performance of external cladding systems and revision of BRE report BR135 under contract CC1924, yes? Yes. Now, was it your understanding that that work came about as a result of the Select Committee inquiry? Yes. And um, by way of context and in very brief terms, is it right that the BR, BRE's work under this contract included the following pieces of work? A literature review? Yes. Preparing and sending out survey questionnaires? Yes. An analysis of the results of that survey? Yes. An experimental testing programme? Yes. A review of and revisions to BR 135, which had first been published in 1988, and that led to a new edition, the second edition of BR 135, published in 2003? Yes. Thank you. Now, what was your role on this project? The uh, technical lead. And at what stage did you become involved in the project, right from its inception? Yes. Yeah. And you tell us in your witness statement, no need to go to it, page 30, paragraph 187, that you think the contract for CC 1924 with the department was let in 2000, yes? Around that time, yeah. yes. Did you have any involvement in preparing the bids, the BRE bids for the contract? Yes. Let's look at the signed bid for the project. This appears at BRE 3041833. We can see... Um, from the front page that it's dated the 11th of November 1999. And it appears that there were two revised versions of the bid after the 11th of November, because there's a revision two. If we could look at that document, BRE 3041836. This is the latest version in time. It's dated the 23rd of December 1999, but it's unsigned. Are you able to assist us as to whether this was the final version of the bid? Sorry, no, I can't. Okay. Um, it's just staying with this um, version, this uh, later version in terms of time, in all the versions, we can see from page one that you are the um, project manager. That's right, isn't it? Yes. It says BRE project manager, Sarah Colwell. And at the time, you were reporting to Debbie Smith in the reaction to fire team. Is that right? That's correct. Now, if we go to page nine of this document, we can see under the heading project team, you're li listed at the top as project manager and leader of all tasks. And then while we're on page nine, we can also see that Brian Martin, four names down, is listed as being responsible for the survey, building control and BR135 redrafting. Is that right? That's correct. Now, we'll come back to this, but in broad terms, are those, those are the aspects of the projects which he did go on to work on? Is that, did that act, actually materialise that those were the parts he did? Yes. Was Mr Martin involved throughout the project from beginning to end? Yes. And if we look at page 11, the sixth paragraph down, there's a heading, project organisation and staffing towards the bottom of the page. And we can see in the second line, it says the project will be led by Ms. Sarah Colwell, Senior Consultant, Centre for Reaction to Fire, under the supervision of Dr. Smith as Director of Centre for Reaction to Fire. Do you see that? Yes. 
Now, your role as the leader of this CC1924 project is not mentioned anywhere in your witness statement. Can you help us? Why is that? Sorry, I don't understand the... No, we're just interested as to why you didn't mention anywhere in your statement to the inquiry that you had been the project lead for this particular project. I don't recall a question in, in, in the way that, that would have... There was, there was no... Sorry, I, I don't... I don't... I don't... I, don't um... I think... Are you saying that you... Because there wasn't a direct question asking you about this, that's why you did. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how did it come to be decided that you would be the project lead? At, at that time, um, Tony Morris was um, leaving the business, um, retiring, and um, I was the, had the most experience and knowledge of the, the systems and, and operations, so it was natural next step um, for me to take the day-to-day lead and running on that, working with um, the, uh, the team to deliver the project. Yeah. And when did you first meet with or discuss the project with Anthony Bird or any other official from the department? At the time the uh, contracts were being um, let, they would have been discussed with uh, Tony and, and Peter, and then when the technical discussions came underway, then I would have got involved at that point. Right. Yes. And you remember having those discussions with Anthony Bird, do you? Yes. Yeah. Now, if we look at page 12 of this document, in the middle of the page, um, we can see under project responsibilities, just below the first lot bullet points, it says all activity on the project shall be subject to the supervision and quality control of Dr Smith. Is that correct? Yes. And was it in fact the case that uh, Dr Smith supervised all of the work on this project? Yes. And provided quality control in yes. respect of it? Yeah, she she um, she would complete the um, authorization reviews. Yeah, how how frequently would you meet to discuss this work with Dr. Smith during the course of the project? Um, frequently, we were co-located, so it was it was an open project. Right, and when you say co-located, you mean you were in the same office? We were in the same office building. Yeah. Yes. And if we look at page three of the bid document. We don't need to run through them all, but we can see there's a heading project objectives which is set out there. And um, do you agree that the objectives of the project are, are this, to review the guidance contained within the approved documents that serve the building regulations with regard to external cladding systems on multi-storey buildings, in particular fire stopping between floors and surface spread of flame, yes? I agree that there is an objective set within that project, yes. And then to update and maintain the building regulations and associated guidance based on a series of experimental studies on new and existing cladding systems, yes? Yes. And to support the process of regulations and harmonisation with Europe, yes? Yes. So looking back at that first bullet, you were certainly involved at this point, weren't you, in reviewing the guidance contained within the approved document? No. The, the objective of the project was to review and to provide that information, but it was not um, to rewrite or to, to present. In, in my understanding of that role, as was presented in the outputs from the project, was to provide the data to enable those that were in the drafting process to undertake that work. Right. It, it doesn't quite say that here, though, does it? It doesn't I appreciate, say... I, appre I appreciate as you say, the wording in that document in, in, in that sense, but that was not my understanding or my delivery of the project at that time because that was not something I was expert in to, to be able to deliver. Right. Did you ever raise that at the time and say, um, in respect of this, I mean, this is the signed bid, uh, sorry, this is the bid by the BRE and you said you were involved in it. Did you ever query um, that and say, well, if I'm going to be the project manager, I, I don't have the expertise to do this. And that was in part why Brian was involved, because that was part of their understanding and, and work in that area. So um, they were, in, as it says in the, in the bid team involved in that, that was with the knowledge for the surveys and the, and the updates. The information that 
the reports provided as outputs were to enable those people who were involved in the guidance delivery to, pre to present that, that information. Right. Did you attempt, at, at, at once this contract was underway, to have a look at the guidance contained in the approved documents in relation to external walls? It, it wasn't extensive guidance. No, abso been... absolutely, yes. It was, it was there. I, I, was aware, I, I was looking at that in terms of what it had said, yes. Yes. Now, underneath these three objectives, we can see that there are a list of uh, DETR apart from the environment, trade and the re transport and the regions, specific objectives for them, which include, if we look at the first bullet, to carry out a survey of the existing high-rise building stock and a database of the results in terms of cladding type, application and market share, yes? Yes. And then the third bullet point was to review and update the existing guidance given in BRE report BR135, yes? Yes. If we go to the top of page four, um, it was also within that bullet point to give guidance with respect to fire stopping, yes? Yes. Um, first bullet point on that page, to complete an experimental programme enabling the assessment of the fire performance of a range of both existing and new cladding systems within 12 months of the start date, yes? Yes. Now, let's, um, we'll come back to that, but... Note existing and new cladding systems there, yes? That's yes. what the experimental programme was looking at. Correct. And then page four, uh, the second bullet point on page four, to utilise the large-scale scenario-based test to determine the most appropriate method for specifying the fire performance requirements of cladding systems, yes? Yes. Now, did all of those particular objectives which are listed in this bid document remain in place and unchanged throughout the life of the project? No. What changed? Uh, there were changes to the um, systems that were selected. There was um, changes with regard to um, the methodology um, and when you say there's a change to the system selected, what do you what do you mean by that? Part of the program was to um, work with industry and stakeholders to determine the systems that were going to be tested and the methodologies by which they were going to be tested, and that developed during the course of the program. Right, but did they remain under the banner of existing and new cladding systems? Yes. Yes. So. Did these objectives, these fundamental objectives change or was it just that some of the details changed? Details changed. Yeah. Now, as part of this project, an industry advisory group was established, is that correct? Yes. Um, who decided that an industry advisory group known as the IAG was to be set up? The department. Right. And did you get an explanation of what the purpose was of this industry advisory group? To provide the um, support in determining the systems that were going for test. Right. Was that to make sure that the systems that were tested were relevant and pertinent to the industry? As we don't have day-to-day -day, um, interaction with the construction industry, it was um, appropriate to, to take those views and those views on board and to bring together the people who were knowledgeable and, and understood what the systems were and what the trends were. Yes. But, but I'm going to ask my question again. Was, was that to make sure that the systems tested were relevant and pertinent to the industry? Yes. Yes. And did the IAG have a role once the systems to be tested had been chosen? Did they have an ongoing role in yes. terms of the project? And what was that ongoing role in summary? Uh, they maintained a role through to the completion of the project. They were updated as stakeholders in the programme and their views were sought. Right. Now, sorry, and their views were sought about what kind of thing? If there were questions around the selection of the materials, if there were questions about the, um, the, the types of designs, then that they were consulted on that. Right. Things like how the, the rigs would be constructed in yes. reality. Yes. To make sure that they were um, replicating end use conditions. As far as possible, yes. Yeah. Now, if we look at um, a document now, BRE 401392.
And um, if we go to the second page, we can see that this is an annual, yeah, here, this is an annual progress review on this project for the period the 1st of April 2000 to the 30th of uh, April 2001, prepared by you for um, Anthony Bird. Do you see that? Yes. And we can see that this progress report was approved by Dr. Smith on the 30th of April 2001. And if we go to page five and look under the heading formation of the IAG, the Industry Advisory Group, we can see it tells us that 30 groups were invited to join the advisory <laughs> group for this project. And they included representatives from manufacturers, specifiers and building owners and users, yes? Yes. And with manufacturers, it's manufacturers of rain screen systems, rendered systems, and built-up systems, yes? Yes. Do you know who chose the organisations that were invited to join the group? Uh, the uh, department would have given us a list of the um, primary um, contacts, and we would have um, also provided details of companies that we knew were... Um, interested in in the activity as well right so it was a collaboration between you and the department yes and who at the department was um, selecting some of these industry um, partners uh, would have been Anthony Bird yeah and do you know what the basis was for selecting them were they just people who were seen to be important within the industry major players in the industry what, what was the criteria trade the trade associations um, in the main who had interest in those sectors would have um, been asked to provide representatives who had knowledge and experience in that area. Right. If we go to um, a document, BRE 30041847, we can see that on the 25th of February, second email down, 2000, you sent um, Anthony Bird and Mike Payne. Who, who was Mike Payne? The department... Um, in this period were using independent <coughs> consultants to manage their contracts. So um, Mike Payne was a representative of um, their um, contract management right. company. And we can see that others are copied in, including Briding Martin and Debbie Smith. And you say, please find attached the proposed questionnaire, covering letter and circulation list. I've also enclosed the proposed membership of the IAD for your comments, yes? Yes. Do you know whether there were any comments on the proposed membership received from the department? I'm not aware of any, no. Right. And who had the final say about the membership? Of, the department. Of, right. And if we go back to the report um, at page five, yes, thank you, under the bullet point list of those main groups... We can see that it's reported in the text. It says 27 representatives accepted invitations to join the group. Their details are given in table one. And then um, if we go to page nine, we can see table one. And you can take it from me that of these 27, the list includes five members of BRE staff, including you, Debbie Smith, Brian Martin, as well as Dr. Jackman from the Loss Prevention Council. Yes? Yes. Three government employees, including Anthony Bird. Um, three local authorities. And then we also see representatives from the BBA, the CWCT. There's a Mr. Peacock from the CWCT who's there. And then various manufacturers and industry associations. Yes? Yes. And was it envisaged that all aspects of the work on the project would be shared with this industry group? Yes. And can you help us in practice? How was this industry group kept up to date with the work that was carried out? Uh, generally by email. Right. And if we look back onto page eight and the first bullet point under the heading conclusions, that reads, it says, the formation and inaugural meeting of the IAG group has taken place. The group has been advised of the generic experimental programme and responses appear to be generally positive, yes? Yes. Did you attend that meeting, that inaugural meeting of the group? Yes. And did Dr Smith and Brian Martin also attend? I, I would imagine so. I have no record to confirm whether they did or they didn't. Right. And can you remember, was Anthony Bird present? Again, meetings of this type would have been set to ensure that people's diaries were 
um, available to attend them. So my expectation is he was present, but yeah. I, I can't confirm. And why is the experimental testing programme described there as generic? Can you help us? It says the group has been advised of the generic experimental programme and is um, the responses are positive. What, what does that mean? It was the department's um, approach when testing a product from market that the uh, details of the actual um, manufacturers and products were not made um, public. So they were described in generic forms. We didn't, we didn't publicly name the system or the, the components that were being, um, being tested. I see. Okay, so that's why the word generics used. And do you know who made that decision at the department? Who, who was responsible for making that decision? My experience had been that that had been in place for many years. Right. And at this early stage, were the group given details of the products and systems that were to be tested? Sorry, uh, yes, yes. They were. Now, to meet the objectives for the project, which we've discussed, several reports were produced. And I want to look at one of the first, which is called Fire Spread and External Cladding, a Literature Review. If we go to BRE 401353, here we see that literature review. And um, we can see it's dated the 30th of March 2000, and it says that it's prepared by you... Jay Foster and Brian Martin, is that correct? That's correct. And it's approved by Dr Smith. We can see her signature and, and the date below that. Who was Jay Foster? What, what team were they in? They were part of the Reaction to Fire team at that time. Right. <coughs> Junior to you or senior to you? Junior. Right. And if we... Um, If we just look briefly at your witness statement at page 23, question 37A, just above 152, you were asked in relation to the literature review, when did any discussions about the commissioning of this review begin? And your response reads, I do not specifically recall when discussions began, but it would have been after the 1999 Select Committee. Um, and at the next question down, B, you were asked between whom did those discussions take place and you say, I believe the contractual discussions took place between Tony Morris as project lead, Peter Field and Anthony Bird of MHCLG. Now, just help us with this. Why do you refer to Tony Morris there as the project lead? The Weren't time, you the project lead? At the, time the com at the time the discussions were taking place post the select committee and the, form and the, the general form that the... Um, contract was going to take, Tony was still in place and taking that those right. conversations forward. I see. But are you saying that by the time the contract was actually bid for and let, I'd you were the that, project I'd, lead? I'd taken that role, yes. So the, the, the scoping and the initial discussions and the outline around that were taking place with, with, um, with Tony. Right. And the bid documents don't mention Tony Morris at all? No, he'd moved out of the activities by that point. Yeah. And if we look at... Um, the very last line on um, page 23, you were asked about your own role in any discussions. And if we go over to the top of page 24, paragraph 154, you say, I provided a technical overview of the issues around fire spread of external cladding systems mm -hmm. and input on the need to look more widely at both previous work in this area and at the research work that was being undertaken globally on this issue at that time. Now, to whom did you provide this technical overview that you're describing? That's part of the drafting process of the literature review. Right, I see. And what previous work did you consider needed to be looked at as part of this review? The items that are identified in the, um, in the review, we would have undertaken a, a literature survey of work that have, had been undertaken involving the type of um, large-scale um, testing we were, we were working with. Right. Um, on page 24 uh, at D, you were asked why the review was commissioned of what its fundamental purpose was. And you say, I understood that the review was commissioned to provide a point of reference on the spread of fire in external cladding based on published information. This is normal practice when any technical study is undertaken. 
Yes. Yes. Um, can you explain what you mean by a point of reference? Why was that needed? Whenever um, research projects of this type are undertaken, we always go back and look at what information is already in the mar already there, what the views and development around that um, exist, and that gives a baseline for for moving forward. Right. And in terms of how this literature review was drafted, we're going to look at some sections of it together in a moment, but if we look at page 24 uh, of your statement, paragraph 157, it's, it's on the page, you say, I cannot recall specific details of our roles, myself, Brian Martin and Jay Foster, and have not identified any documentation that would clarify this. Based on my general experience, I expect that all of the authors would have taken topic areas within the brief and sought literature and published documents on these topics. The findings would then have been written up, collated and collectively reviewed and cross-referenced. And you tell us in the next paragraph that if any comments had been received from the department, those would have been re reviewed and discussed before a final version was published, yes? Yes. Um, was the work on this project split fairly evenly between you, or do you remember one person doing perhaps more of the work than the others? My recollection would, is, is that, as, as, as said, there would have been um, those areas that each of us felt more, most knowledge or experience with would have gone uh, through their uh, literature um, um, access and uh, review based on that, that knowledge and then shared back with the group. So right. yeah. I wouldn't... Um, I, I don't recall there being one heavy lift and, and others right. working yeah. to that. And do you remember any particular topic areas that you took responsibility for? I would... No, not no. specifically, but I would, I would imagine it would be a review of previous experimental programmes. Right. If we can turn to page seven of the literature review, go back to it, so BRE four zeros. Yes, thank you. In the introduction at the top, we're told in that top paragraph that the paper has been prepared... Um, so in the second line it says this paper has been prepared to identify and summarise the types of external cladding systems currently in use, the current requirements and guidance as given in approved document B 2000 revision, yes? Yeah. And the research previously undertaken on external fire spread in buildings, is that right? That's right. Now it's a 25 page report and I'm not going to go through it all, but the first section I want to ask you about is at page 13, in the middle of the page, under the heading the building regulations, you write there, you say the 2000 edition of approved document B to the building regulations 1991 was published in January 2000 and will enter into force on the 1st of July 2000. To comply with the guidance in the approved document, external walls may need to have sufficient fire resistance to restrict fire spread across a site boundary. That's space separation, yes? Uh, yes, I yeah. believe so. And then it says, the combustibility of the outer surface should be of a value that minimises the danger of ignition from an external source and the subsequent fire spread up the external face of the building. Do you see that there? I do. Now, the date of this literature review is March 2000. And it's clear then but that before the 2000 edition of approved document B came into force in July... Um, the authors of this report, including you, yes, were familiar with the amended provisions in that guidance on external fire spread. So that would, as the project outline says, would have, have run from Brian's knowledge and experience of that. Right. So whilst that's contained within there, as I said at the outset, it's not an area that I was expert or working towards. So I would have taken Brian's knowledge and understanding of that as being the position. I see. Are you saying that Brian Martin wrote these passages as opposed to you writing them? He, he would have been expert in that and would have written them, yes. Right. Let's look at another passage on page 14. Um, in the first paragraph there, we can see that in reviewing the requirements of the building regulations in respect of fire performance, um, it, it says, irrespective of boundary distance, 
Diagram 40 in ADB restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings where the top floor is at least 18 metres above ground level. Do you see that? Yes. And then it says, and those of the Assembly and Recreation Purpose Group, to reduce the danger from fire spread up the external face of the building. Now, do you consider that statement to be accurate? I would have relied on, and I still rely on Brian, having had knowledge and experience of working with the approved document to have, have made that as a, as a statement, yes. So you didn't notice at the time that diagram 40 of the approved document doesn't restrict the combustibility of the external surfaces of walls of buildings with a story over 18 metres in height? No. You didn't notice that. And at the time, it was only a requirement for class naught. Um, let's look at it just very briefly. CLG 15012 at page 90. We can see in that last diagram, E, any building, that um, above 18 metres, the black shading shows that it's to be just class naught. This is before the B was introduced in 2002, yes? I, I, yes, if, if that's the correct version of the document. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just don't have a working knowledge of, of the ADs well enough to be able to... Right. Well, you can take it from me. This is diagram 40, as shown in the 2000 version of approved document B. Um, what we were interested in understanding is how the author in this literature review has said that diagram 40 restricts the combustibility of external walls. I think it references in, in part to my point yesterday about this word combustibility and how it's it, it's a it, it's implied that we have definitions of non-combustible we have definitions of limited combustibility anything else is therefore combustible in in that in that context it's the degree of combustibility around that which i think class o is understood that there is a degree of combustion involved in the product Right, but, but the class naught tests don't tell you detailed information about the combustibility of the product, do they? They tell you the rate of fire spread. Across a surface? Across a surface. Right. As I say, there is, there is no formal definition as such. There are a number of definitions of combustible that are in place, but they are not used in, in that way. <clears throat> But you knew by this time, didn't you, or you knew from the work that Dr Connolly had done that a class naught product could nevertheless still burn quite significantly? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So say, class naught doesn't mean that it's not combustible. Quite. So we're just seeking to understand how, how the author has written that, class, that, that diagram 40 is restricting the combustibility of external walls. That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. OK, I think, I think maybe... Um, so class naught is... Um, there are a number of classes of fire spread within part seven. So there is class one, class two, class three, rates of fire spread. Class naught is taken from the lowest rate of fire spread. So a class uh, one or two product could not meet class naught. They no, I understand that. But that's about the rate of fire spread across a surface. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really tell you about the true performance of that product no. in a fully developed fire, does it? No, it no. doesn't. It, no, it and, doesn't. and Dr Connolly's work established that, didn't it? Dr. Connolly's reported that, yes. Yes. I apologise if I've, I've missed the, 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 the point that you're seeking. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm... Should we just go back and look at the passage in the document? Yes, we can. Yes. So page 14 of the literature review, it's at the top of the page, it says, irrespective of boundary distance, diagram 40 in ADB restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings to reduce the danger from fire spread up the external face of the buildings. And we just wanted to understand why that language was used. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't, um, that. 
diagram 40 gives a number of different types of scenarios and a number of different um, characteristics. Well, I think the point Ms. Grange is asking you to consider is whether you would agree that diagram 40 does not tell you anything about the combustibility of the exterior wall, contrary to what is said in this part of the uh, text. Okay, sorry. So if we return to diagram 40, if we could. It, as you, I think I understand the point you make now. It does not talk about non-combustible materials or limited combustibility in diagram 40. Yes, and the tests to achieve class naught aren't telling you about the true fire performance of the product, they're are they? De they're not, they are not defining the uh, non-combustible or limited combustible nature of the product, no. No. And Dr Connolly's work had established that it didn't tell you about the true fire performance of that product and the extent to which it would pose a danger. As an external cladding system. Exactly. Okay. No. Yeah. I th thank you. I apologise if I didn't understand the point. <coughs> no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> Go back to the literature review now and to page 12. There's a heading, um, Facade Costs. And beneath that, set out in tables 1, 2 and 3, are what are described... Um, as um, the typical costs associated with different cladding systems based on the figures given in the architect's journal in February 1998. Do you see that there? Yes. And we can see that below that, different cladding systems are set out, yes? Now, this is important. So it's telling us that the typical costs associated with the different cladding systems as taken from the architect's journal, yes. And if we go down to page 13 and look at table three, in the fourth row down, we can see a cladding system that's described as follows. Composite panel of 0.5 millimeter stove lacquered aluminium, three millimeter polyethylene core, 0.5 millimeter mill finish aluminium with insulation and vapor barrier bonded to rear face. Do you see that? Yes. Now, that is a type of ACMPE, isn't it? It's two skins of aluminium with a polyethylene core. Yes. Were you aware before writing this report that ACMPE panels were in use in the external wall arrangements of UK buildings? No. Was this a surprise to you at the time that this type of panel was being picked up from the architect's journal as a, you know, typical cost associated with different cladding systems? I had not come across the, the product, um, so had no, <coughs> um, no experience of it at that time. Do you accept that from March 2000, when you signed off this report, the BRE and certainly you, Mr Martin and Debbie Smith, were aware that ACMPE products were being used in typical cladding systems in the UK? As, in, as, in, as an infill panel, they were available as a product. Yes. Yes. And presumably, you wouldn't be able to get costs from the architect's journal if they weren't in typical use in the UK. Correct. Did it concern you that such project products were in use on high-rise buildings at the time? No. At this point, in March 2000, what did you know about the fire properties of polyethylene? Poly polyethylene um, as, a, as a product is a combustible product, yes. Did you know quite how poorly that product performed in fire at this point? As, a, as an individual um, product, it, it would be recognised as, as combustible, yes, in, as part of a composite panel, I had no idea how it formed at that point, no. I see. Did you, did you have any thoughts about how it might perform if it had a polyethylene core with two very thin skins of aluminium? It, it, it's as, as a system, it would be difficult to tell what its performance was likely to be, hence the reason that we looked at performance tests. I would not expect polyethylene to perform well, no. Right. 
Did it occur to you at the time and before you did the experimental work that the use of polyethylene at height might present a serious danger in the event of a fire? Prior, prior, to, prior to this, I wasn't aware that it was, it was in place. Right. Was there any discussion about this within the BRE at the time this literature review was put together? Do you remember any discussion along the lines of, oh, we've realised that uh, people are using a panel with a polyethylene core? Um, that's interesting. Not at that point, no. Did that fact strike you when you read the draft of this report? No. So you don't recall any discussions either within the BRE project team or with the department about this particular cladding product at this stage of the project? No. If we turn to page 27, the conclusions of the literature review are uh, set out. And the first one says, there are many definitions for each type of cladding system and it is important to clearly and consistently define each system type to avoid confusion, yes? Yes. And And... Who was that directed to? Who, who needed to con ensure that systems were defined clearly and consistently? It was a finding of the, of the project. So in that the project was being reported to the department, it would be a, 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 a point of reference for them. Right. Moving on to the second conclusion, this reads, the 2000 revision of ADB goes some way to addressing the issues of fire performance of external cladding systems. The review of BR 135 will help to clarify any remaining issues as identified. Do you see that? Yes. Now, you were asked in your um, witness statement which issues specifically this version of the approved document went some way towards addressing. And your response at paragraph 159, page 25, was that the issues are those discussed in the report, which relate to the inclusion of the large-scale test and associated classifications in BR135, yes? That was my understanding, yes. I see. Do you mean that um, there was a note now within ADB, we just looked at it, which referenced the large-scale fire test and fire note 9? Um, my understanding was that 135 would add the classification systems to enable the, um, the, the British standard that was being published as a result of this to be, to be included. And, right. Um, that was my, my understanding of the, the position. Yes. I mean, what I'm seeking to understand is um, the extent to which... Um, well, why the authors are saying that the 2000 revision of ADB goes some way to addressing the issues of fire performance of external cladding systems. Can you help us with that? It was the, um, the inclusion of the, the, full, the full testing method. I see, as a note, as an alternative. As, as reference to it, yes. Right. Because, you see, we've done a comparison of the 1992 version of ADB with the 2000 version of ADB. And I just want to run through some of the, the, the changes. Um, one of the differences was that the height um, in diagram 40 was reduced from 20 metres to 18 metres between 1992 and 2000. Do you recall that? No. No. For insulation, the 1992 version of the approved document relied insulation in the external wall construction of buildings to be of limited combustibility, but it was only insulation in ventilated cavities that had to be of limited combustibility in the 2000 version. Do you remember that? No. But that's a worsening, a reduction in the circumstances in which limited combustibility is required, isn't it? As I say, I'm really sorry. I'm, I, I, I'm find, I don't have the working knowledge of the documents that you're, you're, you're discussing. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to answer your questions to the best of my ability, but I'm doing it a little bit from the information you're giving me. I don't, okay. I don't have a position or an. Or a, no, it's just you're one of the authors of this report. I, I, I fully appreciate that. And as I, as, as we said, the, the, 
the, auth the authorships, as, as I said, for the knowledge and the understanding and the in, in detail interpretation of that was taken from those that had that knowledge and experience. Right. So are you saying that you wouldn't have understood at the time you read this and signed off on this report exactly what was meant by the 2000 revision of ADB going some way towards addressing the issue of fire performance of external cladding and that the person that would have understood that and can be asked about that is what, Brian Martin? Brian may have a different understanding of that interpretation. My, as, as my witness statement says, I understood that statement to, to reflect the inclusion of um, the large-scale method with the review of 135 to help identify the, the changes in the systems that were, that were being seen as part of this programme. And that, that was the knowledge and, and skill set of each of the individuals within that project team. Right. I see. So when you were asked um, in your witness statement, if we go to page 25, paragraph 162, what the remaining issues were, um, you, tell, you told us the remaining issues were carried forward into the revision of BR135, which set out to discuss issues of cavity barriers and external wall systems and the changing designs of cladding systems, yes? Yes. So those were what you understood to be the remaining issues that that, that, that paragraph was referencing? That was, my, that was my understanding of the items that would be taken into 135 that needed to be addressed, yes. Right. And what were the issues of cavity barriers and external cladding systems that still needed to be resolved in BR135? What were those issues? There was um, work around understanding how cavity barriers actually um, operated within the full system testing. And there is a very detailed um, description in the, in the document around... Um, the design um, and issues and formation of cavities in facade and um, externally rendered systems when they're subjected to fire load. Right, I see. And um, you also say there was work around the changing designs of cladding systems that still needed to be resolved. What do you mean by that? Again, uh, the increasing use of thin skin renders um, and the type of uh, insulation used in render systems. Right. Um, during the course of the work on this literature review, was any consideration given either within the BRE or in discussion with the department to the select committee's recent recommendation that all external cladding systems should be required either to be non-combustible or to be tested to full scale? Was that ever discussed? I have no recollection of being discussed explicitly, no. My understanding was that the project was to be undertaken to develop the data sets to enable that work to, to be presented. Right. Now, I want to move on now to another part of the work on this project, which was a survey. If we go back to the objectives of the project, um, or thinking back to them, the BRE was required to undertake a survey of current stock and industry practice in relation to the, high, uh, the cladding of high-rise buildings in the UK, yes? Yes. And that, too, had been specifically recommended by the Select Committee in December 1999. Were you aware of that? Yes. Um, if we look at the Select Committee's recommendation at CLG 3019478, page 10... CLG 3019478, page 10. If we look at paragraph 22, and I, I just want to look at the bold text in the fourth line of that paragraph, if we could maybe expand that on the screen. Paragraph 22. Paragraph 22. 
The bold text reads, four lines down, we recommend that DETR and the Housing Corporation instruct local authorities and registered social landlords to undertake a review of their existing building stock with a view to ascertaining how many multi-storey buildings are currently using external cladding systems and how many cladding systems are in use which, while complying with the regulations in force at the time when they were installed, do not comply with current regulations. And do you agree that's the likely source of the survey which the BRE went on to carry out under this contract, CC 1924? Yes. And just focusing on the second part of the recommendation that I read regarding the compliance of the cladding systems, did trying to establish anything about the compliance or otherwise of the existing cladding systems on buildings form any part of the questionnaire that you prepared or sent out? I don't recall. Um, well, we know that the BRE compiled a questionnaire for completion, and it was um, for completion by a selected number of relevant local authorities. And we've got a copy of that questionnaire. It's at BRE 3041885. Do you remember who prepared this questionnaire? I would have drafted it and run it past um, the um, colleagues, and then it would have to have gone for... Um, clearance by the department because all, contra all surveying activities had to be um, formally cleared by the department before they yeah. were issued. And would Brian Martin have had a role in just reviewing this? Yes. And if we scroll through it, we can see the nature of the questions. They're about the number of units over 18 metres high, the age group of the buildings, whether they've undergone refurbishment, the types of cladding. Um, if we look on page four, question nine the bottom of the page, we can see that respondents are asked about fire stopping and whether they're aware of the use of cavity barriers. Do you see that? Yes. And on page five at question 11, we go over the page, we can see there's a question, have you had any incidents involving fire spread due to external cladding systems? Any details would be appreciated. Do you see that? Yes. Now, we know that the BRE created an Excel spreadsheet to record the responses to the survey. If we could bring up this, and I'll need the native version of it, it's at BRE Okay. What I think I'll do is I'll just carry on and just summarise the information. Yes, yes. Um, you, you, you can take it from me. We've looked carefully at it. Um, in the first tab, of it's an Excel spreadsheet under the heading Introduction. Mm -hmm. There's a record of the number of surveys that were distributed and how many responses were received. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. It tells us that 45 surveys were distributed and that 17 responses were received. Of those, three were nil returns, one was still trying to find the data, and 13 were full re returns. Now, can you help us with this? Why were only 45 questionnaires sent out? It would have been agreed with the department who they were sent to. Right. Was that decision cleared with Anthony Bird? Yes. And do you know who chose the list of recipients? I, I would imagine it would have been done through the department because we wouldn't, BRE wouldn't have had the contacts to, to issue them. Right. Do you know on what basis the organisations were selected? No. And who was responsible for analysing and collating the responses? The BRE. But... As project lead, did you look at those responses to the survey? No, uh, Brian Martin did. Right, so you never looked at the responses? I, I looked at them, yes, but the, the, you, you were asking about the analysis. 
That was, I see. Yeah. So Brian Martin did the analysis, but you would have looked at I, the survey responses. I would have seen the survey responses, yes. Um, in that spreadsheet, there's a, a, a tab that's headed survey responses, and we see the responses of W.S. Atkins are recorded, um, and they are recorded as a specifier um, of cladding products, yes? Yes. So we've got W.S. Atkins responding, and... In the Excel spreadsheet, in the column where their responses are inputted, we see their response to question 11 about whether they'd ever had any fire incidents involving fire spread due to external cladding. And I'm just going to read out to you the answer. I'll read it twice, because um, so, you haven't got it on the screen. Um, there's a note in the cell which reads, BRE, spread of flames generally rapid due to loss of integrity of composite aluminium panels using combustible cores. So the note said, BRE, spread of flames generally rapid due to loss of integrity of composite aluminium panels using combustible cores. Mm -hmm. So that appears to be a note of what was recorded in the W. Atkins survey response. Um, do you know whether anyone contacted W.S. Atkins to find out... Sorry, it's now coming up on the page. Um, to find out what the composite alumin aluminium panels using combustible cores were? No, I don't. I don't recall whether that was done or not. Did you have an idea already about what those combustible cores would be? But at, at that point, um, I've got no, I have no, re I've no recollection of of, um, of that particular um, survey response, right? And how it was followed up. No. Just to be clear, it's under the tab at the bottom, survey responses, and it was column C. W S Atkins. You can see top left of the page, and if you went down the page and you hovered over question eleven, that's the the notes that came up which appear to be the verbatim notes from the... So if you go, if we, someone could go down the page and hover at the bottom of column C, hover over question 11. Sorry, over the box that says yes. There's a note that should come up. Sorry, I think you need to be able to edit the document, so you've got to get enable editing at the top. And then if you hover over yes... Do you see it says spread of flames generally rapid due to loss of integrity of, and it goes on composite aluminium panels using combustible cores, okay? Do you know whether this spreadsheet was sent to the department or is this just an internal BRE document? It would have been provided to the department. If we look at um, another document, BRE 30041887, there's a um, survey, survey summary and options report, BRE 30041887. Here we have it. Um, it's in small text, so DETR Framework Project Report, Survey Summary and Options Report, prepared for Mr. Bird. Um, and it outlined the results of the cladding survey and provide various options for the large-scale experimental studies, yes? Yes. And we can see that page, from page two that this report was prepared by you. Go to page two. We can see prepared for Mr. A. Bird by you, and it was approved by Dr. Smith, yes? Yes. And if we go down to page six under the heading survey responses, it tells us that 45 questionnaires were issued. Of these, 17 responses were received. Figure one summarised the categories and responses received. And it says the number of responses received were less than expected, yes? Mm-hmm. And in fact, we know that there were only 13 full responses received that set out clearly in the Excel spreadsheet. You can take that from me. Why did the BRE not issue further surveys to other organisations when it became apparent that the response rate was so low? As said at the outset, the, um, 
list contacted was um, agreed with the department. So they, um, we reported on the findings and they didn't ask us to go back and extend it beyond then. But with only about a third of organisations organizations responding to this survey, how could the BRE and thus government gain a proper and comprehensive understanding of current industry practice in relation to the overcladding of the building stock in Great Britain? We referred it back to the department to ask for them to, to decide what they wanted to do going forward. We, we, commit, we worked as far as we were able to with the information that we had at that point um, and reported on that and was we left with the department to decide whether they were going to take a greater survey through a different route. And what was the department's response? Did they simply decide to proceed without issuing further surveys? Yes. Right. And were you given a reason for why that course of action was taken? No, no formal response was given to, to that. My understanding was that um, with the industry advisory group on board, they were happy to, to talk with them beyond that. Right. Did you think that the number of responses provided a satisfactory basis? No. It's for, it, it, I, I was assuming that the department would take it on and, and deal with it in a different way, maybe put a, a team on to actually follow it up themselves. Right. Because if we look at page 10 of this uh, report, and we go to the third heading down, survey conclusions, in the first bullet point, it says... Based on this survey, it would appear that although the number of responses have been limited, they provide sufficient data to form a consistent view of the types of external cladding systems used in the public housing sector. Can you help us? On what basis did you come to that conclusion? We were talking about the public housing stock, not the wider, um, the wider sector. Well, how many responses had been received from local authorities? Do you remember? I think um, the majority were from the local housing authorities or from the uh, public housing um, authorities. Right. Because if we go back to figure one on page seven of the report, or if we look at figure one on page seven, and if you look at the returned box um, at the bottom in the table, it looks like from this that only um, five local authorities in England returned surveys and only three in Scotland and one in Wales. That's a total of eight local authorities, yes? Yes. So you nevertheless thought that was sufficient data to form a consistent view of the types of external cladding systems used in the public housing sector? For uh, high-rise buildings, yes. Right, why did you reach that conclusion? A number of the returns, when we'd, uh, we, we spoke, as it says on there, were built, um, authorities that did not hold housing stock at that height. You also acknowledge within the report that some of that information you had collected might even have been duplicated. If we look at the final paragraph on page seven of the report, under the heading specifiers and suppliers, so at the bottom of that page... We can see it says the suppliers and specifiers identified a total of 193 units, but it's not been possible to quantify how many of these units are duplicates of those already provided by the <coughs> local authorities. Would you agree with this, that this is really quite far from the comprehensive survey of the UK building stock proposed in the bid for this contract, isn't it? Yes. And the department were aware of that. And what it was, and they and they 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 chose not to uh, ask us to to revisit or to take any further actions on that, which is why I was of the conclusion that they had decided to take an alternative approach. Right, Mr. Chairman, I'm mid-topic, but I don't think I'm going to finish this topic before the morning break. So I think that's. You think that would be a good point? Yes. Please. All right. Well, we'll take a break now. In that case, um, Dr. Colwell will stop now. We'll resume, please, at 25 to 12. And again, while you're out of the room, please don't discuss your evidence with anyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 25 to 12, Thank please.
Would you ask Dr. Colwell to come back in, please? Thank you. Dr. Colwell? Yes. Off we go then. Yes, Ms. Granger. Yes, thank you. Yes, so we were discussing the the survey that was carried out as part of this um, 1924 work. And um, one of the other conclusions from the survey, if we go back to the survey report at BRE 3041887, we look at page 10. The second bullet point under the heading survey conclusions. It says this, whilst no one clear system was identified, the majority of systems used by local authorities appears to be the render-based systems, with rain screen systems representing around 12% of the market. Do you see that? Yes. Now, did you genuinely consider that conclusions based on such a limited data set, some of which, as we've seen, might have actually duplicated themselves, could have been considered to be representative or reliable to draw such conclusions? It was a statement. It was a statement of the information that we had, and that was based, and that was the basis on which those those comments were raised. Did you consider at the time that such a limited data set ought to provide the basis for a government-funded experimental testing program, which was of such importance to fire safety? Given that this formed part of that, and the industry liaison group were there to also mitigate and provide a wider basis. That, um, that was the, my understanding of the, of the basis on which we were going to go forward with this. Right, I see. If we look at the heading above the survey conclusions, there's a heading in bold fire breaks, and in the second sentence of that, two lines down, we can see it says this. It says, the use of fire barriers appears to be very sporadic, and typical responses included only fitted when asked or unknown. Now, did that cause you concern that that was the um, pattern of responses in terms of whether fire barriers were being fitted? Yes. It did cause concern? Yes. At this point, cavity barriers had been recommended for more than a decade in the approved documents. Were you aware of that? I, I couldn't tell you when, when they were introduced, but um, cavity barriers form part of... Um, the, the, the facade uh, five systems, yes. Do you know whether any discussions were held between the BRE and the department about that particular aspect of the report and what it, what the survey showed? It, it was a finding of the report, therefore it was discussed as this is one of the things that have been identified. Yeah, and do you know whether any action was taken in response to that? I'm not aware of any, any direct action that was taken, no. Did the BRE do anything to draw attention to that in its work going forward? The 135 work um, talks about fire barriers and the use of them, yes. Right. Now, um, just last, and then we'll move on to another aspect of the project. Can we turn to page 12 and the second paragraph under the heading procurement, um, where it said this, it is evident that the insulation industry has a number of highly active lobbying groups. The approach taken by the two main factions, the mineral wool manufacturers and the polymeric core suppliers, has been one of highly aggressive marketing against their opposition. This has led to several articles in the construction press. Do you see that? Yes. Do you know what was the basis for these observations? Uh, the trade press was very um, active at that time with that type of marketing material um, and the um, uh, projects which had previously taken place involving um, uh, some of the radar activities had also had very strong um, support and lobbying from the uh, insulation industries as part of that. Right. Um to which manufacturers were you referring specifically? They're not named, but who were they? The, the, the two main trade bodies from, were, were generally involved in those, those discussions, so it would have been the mineral wool industry and the uh, polymeric industry. It says the mineral wool manufacturers and the polymeric core suppliers yes. has been one of highly aggressive marketing. 
Are you talking about specific companies there? Uh, in in the main, it would have been companies um, that there were two main um, trade bodies who were the main lobbying groups. One representing each of those those particular. And who were they? Um, mineral Mineral the Trade um, Group and the um, Polymeric Cause were um, people like um, uh, EPIC. Right. Did you provide uh, any further details to the department of the identity of the companies that this report was referring to in that section? No, they would have been aware. Right. And if we look at the next paragraph below that, it says, should the department choose to partner these companies for the supply and installation of their products for this project, they should be aware of this background. Experience suggests that the industry sector will wish to ensure the maximum publicity from this work to the detriment of their opposition, and this may prove difficult to manage. In addition, it is important to ensure that the work is independent and free from undue commercial in influence, which is difficult to control when partnering with industry. Whilst we are happy to work with these organisations, it may be more politically expedient to purchase the materials and service, services on the open market in order to ensure that a level playing field is maintained in the marketplace. Do you see that there? Yes. Um, what experience did the BRE have that suggested that industry would seek to ensure maximum publicity from any partnership to the detriment of the opposition? Uh, I'd say there have been previous PII projects um, where there had been uh, some difficulties controlling publication of, of data and information as a result of that. Right. Can you remember particular companies that were involved with that? Uh, again, most of it was driven through the trade associations rather than through individual organisations. Right. Does this passage indicate that as early as 2000 you had valid reason to be sceptical about the practices of manufacturers in the insulation industry? Yes. That being the case, why were manufacturers included in the industry advisory group for this project? Because they were relevant sectors... They had, they had a role to play in that process and it was highlighting that they needed to be managed correctly in that process. Did you or anyone else at the BRE have any concerns that industry might seek to influence aspects of this work for their own purposes if they were involved? Ultimately, companies will only become involved if there is something for them to gain from that process. So, yes, that was always a, a balance that we had to be very conscious of. Right, I see. Let's move then to the experimental testing programme. Um, on page 12 of this uh, summary and options report, two design options for the full-scale test programme are set out. We can see there at the bottom of the page, option one is called Fire Note 9, and what it says is, from the information provided in the survey and in order to address the trend towards increasing thermal and acoustic performance in the residential housing market, the following experimental program is proposed. This option does not provide any indication of the performance of built-up systems or preformed insulation panels. The test will be carried out in accordance with BRE Fire Note 9 using the test facility at BRE Cardington. And then underneath that... <clears throat> Essentially, there are three sets of systems that are identified. Set one is said to be rendered systems, and three tests are identified underneath that with different types of insulation, including test three, phenolic foam insulation. If we go over the page, set two is ventilated rain screen systems with no fire barriers and different types of uh, rain screen systems are identified, including those that have uh, passed class naught. Do you see that in test three and four? Yes. Do you see that? And yes. then it's talking about you could repeat those tests with fire barriers. And the total of 11 tests, the indicative costs were 5,000 to 12,000 pounds per system, yes? Yes. So that was option one in this report. Um, did you put together this proposed uh, testing programme as option one? Yes. And who contributed to the discussions about, around what was to be tested? Uh, the uh, 
conversations with um, stakeholders um, around the types of materials and panels in, in place and um, their experience of that. I see. So were you trying to get systems which were typically in use? Yes. So it was a maximum value to government and to the industry more generally? Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll come back to how you actually got hold of those components in a moment. But if we look at option two below that, you put forward a, a second option in this particular survey report, and that's called modifi Modified Fire Note 9. And in the first paragraph, it says, during discussions, it's become increasingly obvious that there are several issues relating to the use of build, built up systems and preformed insulation panels that should be addressed as part of this project. It should also be noted that the Joint British Standards Committee working on Fire Note 9 test method is recommending that a part two of the standard be developed to address the testing of built up preformed insulation where no masonry wall is present and curtain wall systems. We currently have no experience of their fire behaviour in this scenario. And um, below that, it says the major change between the existing test method and the second scenario is the influence of an internal masonry wall. The existing test facility is designed with this internal wall, i.e. the masonry wall, in place. This is an inappropriate test scenario for the built-up and preformed insulation systems that are installed in practice. And then they're saying, in order to, you're saying, in order to address this, the test facility would need to be redesigned. And, and then you go on beneath that. So, in short, is what you're saying here that with these preformed systems that are like complete systems, which don't have a masonry wall as a backing, you'd need to have a completely different test facility to test that. Yes. Um, and that would be a wholly different project. Yes. Yes. Or, or an extension to the existing, but it would need to be addressed in a different way. Yes, I see. Um, and was that effectively the, the, the precursor to BS8414 Part 2? Yes. And testing steel frame systems? Yes. Yes. Um, the paragraph, the next paragraph begins from, and it says, from the work undertaken in the 1997 PIT project, we have some limited knowledge of the behaviour of proprietary ventilated rain screen systems, and we are aware of some further work under a DOE contract about that. So is that the PIT project, is that Partners in Technology, yes? That's, that's the second Partners in Technology project. As I explained yesterday, there were two elements to it. We had some information on the uh, ventilated rain screen, but we didn't have the information on the renders because that wasn't available to us through that contract. Right. And that project, um, we can tell from the footnote, which is on a different page, but that it tells us that that's Fire Note 3 it's referring to. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So that was work that ran up to Fire Note 3? Yes. What was your knowledge about the behaviour of proprietary rain, ventilated rain screen systems at the time? It says you've got some limited knowledge of it. In what way was that knowledge limited and what was known? So it was the systems that... The limited number of tests that were done for Fire Note 3, that was the knowledge we had of them at that time. Right. And how did those systems behave, in short? Uh, some passed, some failed. Right. So it was a mixture. It was a mixture. Mix, mixed picture. Mixed picture. Yeah. Um, and looking at the next paragraph on the final page, it says, accepting budgetary constraints associated with this project... The large-scale experimental programme may be better served by considering a modification to Fire Note 9 to allow built-up systems and preformed insulation panels to be tested. And then it goes on and says, a new, in order to undertake this change in test scenario, a new test facility would be required. The construction of such a facility would reduce the budget available for the purchase and supply of full-scale systems, but would provide a good basis on which to expand the scope of the existing guidance in BR135 to cover the emerging market trends for which we currently have no data. This data could also be used to support British standards activity. Um, what were the budgetary constraints referred to in the first part of that? If we just go back so you can see the paragraph. In the, the first lines, you're talking about budgetary constraints. There was a fixed budget available to undertake the work. Right. And... Did you push one option over the other option in discussions with the department? Did, you, did the BRE have a preference as to which option the department should go down? 
the preference was to, to look to um, maximise the information we had available to us and given the ongoing trend then option two had been suggested because that's where we felt the market was uh, was moving and we had no information about what that right. looked like. So you'd have preferred to have gone with option two, yes? It, yes, option two was, was, the, um, was the preferred route. Right. And if we look over the page, if we just look to the end of that, back to the end of that on page 14, you say it's not possible to offer fixed budgetary figures for this option, but the costing could be obtained, yes? Yes. Um, was this option ever given any further consideration by the department at any stage? Yes. And when was that? Um, following on from the first stage of this project. Right. And, and was that second project undertaken? Yes. Right. Now, um, it's right, isn't it, that the testing programme, which was eventually undertaken and reported as part of this project, was different from option one and from option two, but it was slightly different from option one, wasn't it? Yes, it was. A total of 14 full-scale tests were carried out with a third set of tests on com composite panel systems. Is that right? That's correct. And were they all carried out on masonry substrates? Uh, there was a mix. A mix? Yes. And how was that testing programme that was eventually decided upon, um, how, how did... How was that decision reached? Was that simply the department coming back to you and saying, no, this is what we want to do, or was that joint discussions? That was discussions with the industry group, with the department and with ourselves. Fundamentally, it was the department's decision as to which route they wanted to take because they were um, uh, sourcing the products that were being tested. Right. And what was the rationale behind the approach which was eventually taken to do these 14 tests, including some on composite systems? How did they explain that to you? It was based on the information guidance they had about the types of systems that were um, in the marketplace and needed to, they needed to understand what they, those looked like in practice on the large-scale test. I see. Did they have information which you didn't have about the types of systems that were in the marketplace and that they needed to understand? Or was there information all coming from you and the survey that you'd done? I, I believe they were having their own discussions internally as well. I would, I would, uh, I would, I would suggest that they, they were obviously taking their own um, um, soundings. I would expect them to have been doing that. Right. And was the ultimate programme decided before testing began or did it change as the experimental programme was running? I, my apologies, I really don't remember. I would not be surprised if there were variations towards the end of the project. Okay. It, it, it would be quite normal to undertake the first series to review and then to... Uh, Reevaluate and <coughs> and change, but I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I no, that's I, I fine. Can't remember the X program. Let's look at an email that might help a little bit. If we go to BRE four zero six two eight five, this is an email from you to Anthony Bird and Mr Payne, copying in Debbie Smith and Peter Field, um, on the tenth of August two thousand and one, and it's for contract CC nineteen twenty four. And we can see that you are proposing changes to the testing programme some time after it's begun. Um, we'll come back to this email, but if you look at the last line on page two, you say, in order to keep the project online, I'd like to arrange a meeting to review the project to date and discuss finances as soon as convenient to yourselves. Now, um, during this experimental testing programme and that phase of it, how regularly were you in touch with Anthony Bird? There would be agreed regular um, reporting um, in line with the contract that would be addressed with the um, contract um, management company Mike, through Mike, um, Mike Payne. And then um, they would be fully aware of the testing programs and the dates they were taking place so they could um, attend if they wished to do so. So there was a, a regular dialogue in place. Yeah. And do you remember having a meeting to review the project and discuss finances with Anthony Bird around this time? So I would, I, I, yes, I, I imagine that would have taken place. I, I, I don't recall a, a date or an exact time for it, but that would be 
um, yeah, perfectly normal. If we go back up to page one of the email, we can see here that you are um, setting out in quite a lot of detail the tests that have been carried out by that stage and, and giving him pretty detailed updates. Was that typical? Is this a fairly typical update email to him yes. about the tests? Yes. Yes. So the department understood this information and, and were getting information in a lot of detail about this work, yes? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Now, in terms of the suggested options for the full-scale testing, the rendered systems in set one, they were not all repeated with fire barriers, were they? I, I, my apologies, I don't, ha I don't recall... The, the, de the absolute details, if, if, if the, yeah. you have the, the uh, yeah, data the, there. The information we have um, seems to suggest that not all of the render systems were repeated with fire barriers and the ventilated rain screen systems were not repeated with fire barriers and we were just interested in <coughs> why that was. Uh, may well have been... I, the, the data suggested that there was um, either no need to do that because they had... they, they um, showed a form of performance that, that um, didn't need to be further investigated. Right, I see. Um, and in fact, of the 14 full-scale systems undertaken, only two, one a render system and one a rain screen system, actually contained fire barriers. Do you remember that? Um, if, yes, if, if that's the, the data, I wouldn't... Um, yeah. Disagree. Well, let's go to the analysis report. It's at BRE 304182. We can see it's headed analysis of ISO 9705 European and British standard fire test data for BR135 project. And it's dated the 19th of September 2002. On page two, we can see the report was prepared by you and it was approved by Dr. Smith. And if we go down to page five and look at the introduction um, section, um, in the second paragraph, the report tells us, it says, as part of the review process, 14 full-scale fire tests were undertaken using the Fire Note 9 test methodology. The results from this work are presented in BRE report and then a reports given. The systems identified and tested at full scale were also assessed at intermediate and bench scale using the following test methods. And then we can see that those tests are set out and we can see that those tests included the BS 476 Part 6, the fire propagation test, and the 476 Part 7 surface spread of flame test, yes? Yes. Together with other tests, um, the next one is a full-scale room test for surface products. Um, the single burning item test was carried out. You see that below that? Yes. And then um, reaction to fire tests, ignitability when subject to direct impingement of flames, yes? Yes, so what they were looking at was the, um, the dual coding that we talked about yesterday, so the class O and the 13501 part one. Yes. And just for clarity, if we go to page 10 and table one, this summarises the systems tested at in intermediate and bench scale. This only refers to 13 systems, but we think the reason for that is that um, if we look at page 23 and look briefly at table 8, where the, the summary of all the results are set out, and we'll come back to this a number of times, it looks like the only difference between test 3 and 4 under set 2, render system, is the provision or otherwise of fire barriers. And that appears to explain why we only see 13 systems in the earlier table, but 14 here. Can you help us with that? I think the point might be that fire barriers can't be incorporated into intermediate yeah. and bench scale tests. Uh, yes, yes. It, yeah. um... Now, I want to start by looking at the 14 full scale tests. It appears from the documents we have that they were carried out at various times between the 31st of May 2001 
and the 14th of November 2001, but on some occasions more than one test appears to be have carried out within one day. Does that sound right? Yes. Were you present at all of the large-scale tests? No. Can you remember which ones you attended? I was present for the rain screens and the competent panels. There were uh, some of the renders that I wasn't present for. OK, thank you. Do you know who else from the BRE attended the full-scale tests? There would have been various staff yeah. uh, involved in the, in the project who would have been present. Do you have a memory of Brian Martin and, and Dr Smith attending some of these tests? I couldn't tell you which tests they attended, but okay. I would be, they, they would have been present, yes. Yeah. Did any officials from the department attend any of these tests? Yes, they would have. They would have done. Were they always told about when the tests were happening? Yes. And you have a recollection of them sometimes attending, do you? I, I, can, I can recall them witnessing the tests, yes. With a member of the department there? Yes. And who was that? Uh, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony um, Bird. Anthony Bird and uh, Mike Payne. And what was Mr Martin's role in relation to this full-scale testing? We, we saw earlier a description of his role, um, but For, we're not clear on what his role was in relation to this part of the project. In this part of the project, it was um, experience, just so he had a knowledge of the, of the testing. He wasn't um, part of the actual delivery. Yeah, I see. Um, if we look at the BRE's closing report for this project, which is at BRE 3041895, um, and go to page 9, we see a list of the 14 full-scale tests which are carried out with the description of the main components of the systems used in each test. Now, can you help us? Why are the specific products not identified by reference to the product name and manufacturer? Um, it's, it's, we... Uh, spoke in the uh, earlier, the department chose not to um, uh, put the, the actual manufacturing details uh, or the full specifications into these types of reports. Right. But was that information separately provided to the department? So they did know what these yes. products were? Yes. How was that provided? Um, th that would have been, as part of the procurement of the products, they would have been advised of the, the systems that were being tested. Right. Are you able to help us about why that information doesn't now seem to exist? The inquiry has asked for information as to specifically what products form part of these systems, but we've been told that that information is not available. Do the, you know why? The, 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 the passage of time, the, the final reports have been held, but the actual... Um, individual uh, test record files are no longer uh, in place. Right. And no one thought that it might be important to keep um, a separate record of the specific products that were um, used in these tests? I say, when, when we, we went to look for those, those records, they were, they were no longer held in place. Right. And can you help? Who funded the large-scale testing? Were all of these tests funded by the department? Yes. Were the manufacturers or industry organisations involved in funding any of these tests? No. Did you purchase the products which were incorporated into the tests from the open market, as you had suggested ought to happen in the survey summary and options report? Um, a consultant was um, employed to do that. And... and um, who was that consultant? Uh, it was a an an, an individual um, uh, company um, who were uh, cladding installation, who were working the cladding installation uh, field. Right, I see. But someone with no interest in these particular systems. No, they they were in, in they were installers. Um, of these types of systems and, and knew how how to specify what needed to be purchased and right. and how to install and um, uh, did any manufacturers or industry organizations supply any of the components in these in these systems no if we look at um, an email now bre 406370 
This is an email from you to Debbie Smith on the 15th of March 2002. And it appears that you're asking Debbie Smith to check the email that you drafted to send to Mike Payne. Mm -hmm. And you've told us what Mike Payne's role was. Um, your draft email to Mr. Payne reads below that. You say, further to our telephone conversation, please find below confirmation of the position with regard to the provision and testing of the remaining external cladding systems. The provision of material for this project lies outside the framework agreement, and from the outset, we've undertaken to procure and supply the materials for this project on an at-cost basis. The initial materials estimate supplied to you is the best estimate available at the time when the project was being developed. As the project's gone on, we've continued to procure the materials and services required to complete this project while passing all invoices to yourselves directly. To date, the invoices received and forwarded to you total 117,000. Uh, 570 pounds. This covers all materials supplied, installed and tested to date to meet the requirements of this contract. This covers all full-scale tests, but only the rain screen and composite panel systems at small scale and ISO room. And then you're asking in the last paragraph for another 24,000 pounds to complete the small scale and room corner tests on the render systems. And you say without these tests, we won't have the information available. Now, this email appears to make it clear that it was the BRE who sourced all the materials for testing, yes? We, we, um, <clears throat> we were asked as, uh, as part of the contract to, um, to undertake the procurement on behalf of the department and the as, as it says in there and, and provide those back to the, the invoices back to the department. The procurement was through the um, contractor Right. To, to ensure the independence of the process. Right. So we didn't go to the market and purchase, no. Yes, I see. Um, and had you taken the components and configuration of each full-scale test to Debbie Smith for her sign-off, is that the level of oversight she had on each, each of these tests? The, the procurement would have gone through... Um, through Debbie, yes. So she would know exactly what you were ordering for each test um, and at what cost? She would know the costs, she, uh, but wouldn't necessarily be aware of the, the system build-ups in, in, in uh, fine detail, no. Okay. But in broad terms, she'd be aware of it. Yes, them. yes. Um, and what about Anthony Bird on the department more generally? Was approval from the department required for the makeup of each of the tests? That was agreed. That was agreed as part of the test program. Hence the email exchanges going forward. So yeah. yes, they were fully aware of what was being tested. Yeah. And who designed the test rigs for the full-scale tests? The consultants. Right. And who approved the designs? Did you, the BRE, approve those designs? Uh, um, we we confirmed that they would be they, that they would fit onto the rig and they were suitable for for the rig. But the actual um, how. Um, appropriate they were we had to rely on their knowledge and skill right. set for and did the the third party contractor actually build the systems onto the rigs yes they did but did someone from the bre supervise or oversee that yeah we were present during the construction yeah so you knew how the build-up yes. worked in practice you yeah. watched it happen we watched it happen yeah um now if we go to bre three zero four one nine one two we see a tabulated summary of the full-scale test, including the results of each test. Now, this is an internal BRE document. Would this have gone to the department? I think it, what we need to do is go right to the left-hand side, so in the, in the scroll bar in the bottom right. That's it. Thank you. If we go right to the left. So would this kind of information have gone to the department? Yes, this is the table. This is the um, table that went into the uh, report. Yeah, and the fourteen test tested systems are listed through from columns A to C, and the overall results from each are in column S. Yes, whether it was a pass or a fail. Yes, and that was to the method in Fire Note Nine. Yes. yes, and we can see that from column S, that four of the fourteen tests resulted in a pass, with all of the others failing. Yes. Yes. Three of the systems which passed were in set one. That was the render systems, yes? Yes. There was one pass from set three in the composite panels at the bottom. 
Yes. And none of the rain screen panels in set two, none of those passed, did they? No. And then if we go back to the BRE's closing report for the department at BRE 30041895, page nine, just want to ask you some more questions about some of the systems which were tested. We see in table one there, under rain screen systems, item five refers to aluminium sheets mounted on aluminium rails, no fire barriers. Do you have that? Yes. What was the name of the aluminium sheet product? ACM. And who is the manufacturer of that product? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Well, can I just ask you, um, <clears throat> you say the product was called ACM, is that right? No, it was... Ah. It was an ACM product. We described it as an aluminium sheet product. Yeah, but what I'm interested to know is what was it? Was it as simply a sheet of aluminium, or was no, it? No, it was an AC, it was an ACM product. It was an it was an ACM panel. Yeah, thank you. I think we'll come to some other documents just in a moment that give us a little bit more detail about this. But sure. this is how these panels were reported. Yes. And I, I will come back to this point in the final report. They're just described as aluminium sheets, aren't they? They are. Now, I think you've confirmed that these panels were, in fact, aluminium panels with a polyethylene core, yes? yes? Yes. And these were one of the types of panels referred to in that literature review, which we've already looked at, yes? Yes. Taken from typical costs of cladding systems set out in the Architects' Journal. Yes. If we look at BRE, um, BRE 30041882, this is the BRE's analysis report... And on page 10, table 1, if we go down uh, to item 5 under the heading rain screen, here the system is described differently. It says aluminium slash polyethylene core sheets on aluminium railing. Do you see that? Yes. And in another document, if we go to BRE 30041909, this is a blank tabulated summary for all the testing results. In the final row under the heading rain screen, we can see the description aluminium polyethylene core sheets on aluminium railing. Yes? Yes. Now, were you present during that test? I don't recall being, I don't recall being present for the small scale tests. No, during this full scale test. The full scale test, yes. Yes. We, sorry, I'm not clear. I, I can see that's a tabulated summary for the small-scale tests. I was just getting the description from that. No. But I'm talking about the large-scale test, the Fire Note 9 test that was done with this aluminium composite panel. Were you present for that? Yes, I was. And who else was present? Can you help us? Do you have a memory of it? I'm sorry, no, I can't. The, the, the normal... Um, BRE team would have been there, but I, I can't think of any... I can't. If, if you're asking where other visitors present, I don't recall them being, visit, uh, being present, no. Well, we were interested to know who was present, both from the BRE and the department. Mm. Um, do you remember anything about that? I don't remember anyone from the department being present, no. Right. Do you remember any of the... In, were, the were the industry advisory group invited to witness these tests? They were, um, and I don't, I don't believe anyone was present for that particular test. Right. Now, this test is noteworthy in terms of fire performance and in particular the early, early manual termination time before six minutes, yes? Yes. Um, if we look at the tabulated summary again at BRE 30041912. Sorry, we need the native version of that again. If we go, um, it's in row, row five under the rain screen systems. We can see, um, sorry, it's in row 15 under the rain screen systems. We can see in column R that this one failed at 5.75. Do you see that? Yes. And it says fail externally plus and internally in column S, yes? Yes. Now, 
Can you explain why, in many of the documents reporting on this project, you've referred to these panels simply as aluminium panels or aluminium sheets? It was, it was used as a generic description. Um, we talk about um, steel sheets and we talk about thin screen, screen renders. It was, um, it was just a generic description of the, of the product. Can we agree it's an inaccurate description of the product? It doesn't tell the reader what they need to know about that product. It could, it could have been described differently, yes. As, 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 a, as a generic grouping, yes, it could have done. Well, I appreciate it could have been described differently. I'm going to put the question again. It's an inaccurate description of the product, isn't it? It doesn't tell the reader what they need to know about that product, that it's an ACM, aluminium composite material product with a polyethylene core. In, yeah, yes. In, in the same way as the composites could have been described differently and the renders could have been described differently, yes. Yes, but you accept it's inaccurate. It doesn't give a full description, I would accept that, yes. And it's apt to mislead, isn't it? Because as per the chairman's questions earlier, someone might read that and think that an aluminium sheet was a solid aluminium sheet, yes? I, yes, I accept that. Why did you choose ACMPE as one of the products to be tested in this programme? Can you explain the rationale behind that? It would have been offered to us as part of the in industry interest uh, and, and industry use. Yeah. Was there any particular discussion between you and others working on the project about the inclusion of that particular product? No. Was it included on the basis of the typical costs for cladding systems that were reported in the Architects' Journal? Was that one of the reasons why it was selected as per the literature review? I don't believe so, no. So what my, was the reason? My, my understanding is that it was offered to the project as being a product of interest. Did you understand it to be a product that was typically in use within the market at this time? I, un I understood it was a product that, that was available to the market and, and therefore it was of interest, whether it was current, in current use or um, for future use, I, yes. I wasn't aware. And what do you remember now about that test on the system incorporating ACMPE panels? It was a, it was a test that um, failed, failed in very early stages. Yes. If we look more closely at the results of the, the testing for this, if we go back to page uh, 23 of BRE 30041882, to the results table for the full tests... It's row five under the heading rain screen systems. Do you agree that this system reached the Fire Note 9 failure criteria extremely rapidly? Yes, it did. What was your reaction at the time to it doing so? Shocked. So we can see it gets to the external time within three minutes and the internal time within 4.34, is that correct? That's correct. So you were shocked? I was shocked at the speed it took off, yes. Can you remember the reaction of any others who were present at the test? We were all surprised. And the test, we know, was manually terminated at 5 minutes 75, um, which is why the test time is given at 5.75, yes? That's correct. Why was it terminated at 5.75? Can you remember? The um, extent of the fire spread meant that it was, um, it couldn't continue, so it was, it was terminated. Was it because allowing it to continue would have been dangerous? Within, within the facility we use, um, it, 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 it was um, an appropriate point to, to intervene because there was no point in allowing it to continue to burn. So yes, you, um, you wouldn't, have, wouldn't have continued with it um, for no for no good reason. Yeah. Can we agree that in very simple terms, this was an, an inferno, wasn't it? It was a very rapid, very large fire growth, yes. Yeah. I mean, there is a distinction, isn't there, between just letting it burn itself out... Absolutely. Was uh, ...and it, having to stop it because it's, a, it's creating a danger to the surrounding building or whatever's there. 
yeah, within that environment, it, it was um, it, it was a significant fire. Yes. It's dangerous. Is that what you're telling me? For the facility, for the, for the large aircraft hangar we're working in, no, it wasn't dangerous. It could have burnt itself out, but. In, in that context, it, it was a large fire and we intervened at that point. Right. But I say that's given the context of that large building in which that test was undertaken. Right, thank you. And this was a product which achieved national class naught in the BRE's smaller scale testing, yes? When we tested it, it, it achieved class zero, yes. Yes, so it, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. If we can go to page three of BRE, here we go. Yes, these are the detailed observations from the PE called aluminium rain screen cladding test. Can you re help us? Who recorded these observations during the test? It would have been one of the experimental team. I don't remember who else, who was doing that on that day. Right. We can see that at three minutes, five seconds, halfway down that table, molten aluminium was dropping from the front face of the panel, yes? Yes. Do you remember witnessing that? Do you remember seeing that molten aluminium drop, dripping, dropping from the front face? I remember watching the, the rapid fire propagation of the, um, of the system, yes. And at four minutes, 20 seconds, the flames had reached the top of the rig, yes? Yes. And then just 40 seconds later, at five minutes, it says the flames were approximately twice the height of the rig, 20 metres, yes? Yes. yes. So you've got 20 metre flaming, yes. is that right? This was a catastrophic escalation, wasn't it? It was a very rapid fire growth, yes. And this result was alarming, surely, to those who were present and witnessing the test. Yes, as I said, we were quite shocked at that rate of growth. Was there a sense of alarm at the BRE in the wake of this test? We were very surprised by that, by that performance, yes. What about the department who were aware of it, who either witnessed it or saw the test results? Do you remember them expressing alarm at the catastrophic escalation of this test? Yes, they, we, we, were, all, um, we were all concerned at, at, at the performance of the product. And whatever else you might have concluded from this project, did you consider after this test that the use of ACM panels on a high-rise building would present nothing other than a grave risk to occupants in the event of fire? I, 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 I genuinely, yes. I, I, I couldn't see that ACM would be a, an appropriate product to, for, for use in that application. So you, can, does it, is it fair to say that you didn't consider PE called ACM to be suitable for external cladding applications in high-rise buildings? Correct. And what about others? Were there any discussions with the department about whether this was a suitable pro product that could be used to clad high-rise buildings? I, 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 I don't believe anyone felt that it was appropriate. Did anyone consider alerting industry or local authorities or building control or other building owners to this result and to the obvious dangers posed by these panels? Uh, how uh, the department chose to uh, transmit that, I don't, I don't know. Were you aware of anyone discussing that there might be a need to alert those kind of third parties to this result and the obvious dangers you'd identified? We, we had made, oh, I'd made the department aware of, of the outcomes and, and, and what was um, occurring with that. And um, they were obviously um, then in, in a position to take the dissemination route that, that they would, would do with that. Is the answer that no one within the BRE thought about doing that in the light of this test? Would n we would not go out... Um, we would not go out and make make comment around around that. No. Why not? We were uh, un delivering this to the department for them to take forward and make the um, necessary statements, provisions, and changes arising from that. 
was not something we we would do um, from um, from the type of contract work we were, were involved with. But that's not quite right, is it? Because you were also reviewing and revising BR135. That's what this work is leading up to, yes? So in, in talking about, and, and within the context of 135, that's what the information is being placed placed into the, into the document around what the large-scale test is there to do. Yes, but, but we'll, we'll come to it in due course. Nowhere within the second edition of BR135 do we see a very clear warning about the use of this kind of product, do we? That wasn't the aim to... Um, the aim was to discuss how the large-scale test was to be used to identify products that might behave in this way. Did you have an expectation that the department would notify relevant third parties about the results of this test and their shock and their alarm well, it was, after this point? There's this test and, and there's the findings from the whole programme. It's not just the, um, the ACM in, in isolation. There are, there are findings across the, across the piece and that was um, the expectation that they would um, uh, use that information to... Uh, alert the um, industry to to the needs for not only this particular product but the others that were identified in that in that program right did you ever become aware of a time when the department took action to alert third parties to the risks involved with using this kind of product on tall buildings did you ever become aware of that action at having taken place I was no. I'm, I'm, I was never made aware that they they'd spoken directly to anyone around that. No. No. And were you concerned about that at the time? In retrospect, yes. But at the time, um, I wasn't aware that they hadn't. So therefore, um, I. I'm. I'm still. I'm still shocked that it is and was used. So. Um, yes, I, with uh, reflection, I am shocked that they didn't follow it up at that time. Yeah. When you say, I'm still shocked that it is and was used, this product's been selected. It's been selected partly because industry have told you we're really interested in this. Mm. Um, so it's clearly relevant to industry. Surely then you would understand that it might be in use. My understanding at this point is that we had identified that there was an issue and that that was going forward um, with the department taking the actions arising from the programme to take the necessary steps to, to alert and identify. Right. But I think you've made yeah, it clear yeah. that you never became aware of them having done that. I wasn't made aware that they'd spoken to industry, but then I wouldn't necessarily be made <coughs> aware that they were spoken to industry because I don't have that, that, that interaction with them. Did anyone discuss um, the possibility of trying to ascertain how many buildings had already been cladding this material? Was that a conversation that anybody had, either within the BRE or with the department? No. Did you consider advising government that that step was a step that ought to be taken? You need to now identify any buildings that are clad in this stuff, particularly high-rise buildings, because this has been a disastrous test. We reported the survey as we had at that time. As you have said, it was a very limited snapshot. What actions they took after that to determine what was on the wider selection of buildings and how that was being addressed was something dealt with within the department, not something that we were asked to, to engage with. Yeah. I think you said, as you have said, it was a very limited snapshot. Not sure I've said that. Did you have any expectation that it might perform differently if you re-ran the test? Sorry, I, I think we've... Well, you're saying it's a snapshot, as, no, as, no, if, no, as if it might have been a rogue result. No, I was referring to the survey that we spoke about earlier. Oh, I see. So that was a, just a snapshot of it was in use then. Why would you think it was any less in use than it was at the time of the survey? Well, the survey was a, a small piece 
of work as we discussed earlier. The extent to which this was in use and therefore the implications and um, wider section on that was a discussion that I believe was with the department to understand how that was going forward. We had identified this particular process. We had made them aware that there was an issue around this product and how they then went to the market to identify that with them was something that was left with the department to identify. It was not something that was in my um, remit under the, the contract to, to, to take forward. I'd identified that with them. I'd made them aware of that and um, the course of action that they chose to take around that was something I wasn't party to any discussions around. Whether they talked about it internally, I don't know. Okay. Let's look at some of the other full-scale tests that were carried out. If we could go back to BRE 3041882 at page 23, that table, under the heading Render Systems, in the middle of the page, there are references to phenolic insulation and polyurethane insulation at items one and two, respectively. Do you see that? Yes. What was the name of the polyurethane insulation product? Can you remember? And, and who was the manufacturer? Uh, no, I don't have. I don't remember the the name of the 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 in, uh, insulation product. What about the phenolic insulation product? Can you remember that? I'm sorry, no, I don't. Looking further down the table, under the heading Composite Systems, there are references to polyisocyanurate cord panels and polyurethane cord panels, items one and two there. Can you help us with the identity of those products or the manufacturer? No, there, are, there, there were a number of manufacturers um, that, they, that any of those products could have come from. Yeah. Why is only the core of these composite panels described in this table? Sorry, I don't know. Can you help why the core of these panels isn't described? They're, they're, they're said to be composite panel systems, and we're told that they're cored with certain material, but we don't know anything about those composite systems, anything further. Can you explain why we don't see that in the description? They would have been um, <coughs> generic re generically referred to as sandwich panels. Right. We understand them to have involved steel, those panels. Is that correct? As, as a um, sandwich panel, they would, they would typically, yes, they would have been steel-faced. So why not just say that in the data? Isn't that very helpful for the reader of this data to, to understand? Composite panels are, by their nature, sandwich panels. And as I say, the generic description is, um, I say, a PIR, PIR composite panel. Right. Neither of those panels achieved class naught, national class naught in the testing, did they? I don't know. Well, we, we've checked the I was going to say, sorry, I, haven't, I don't have the data in right. front of me. Right. Well, yeah. you can take it from me that they didn't achieve sure. national class naught. Just staying with um, page three, 23 for the moment, both the tests on the PIR cord composite panel and the PUR cord panel failed the full-scale test due to flame penetration, yes? Yes. Did this concern you at the time that you've got these sandwich panel products, that they're achieving national class naught, but they are failing the large scale test? Yes, as, um, as I was saying, there were a number of, a number of failures in this program. And we're, was, was, was the number of failures a, a surprise, yes. both in respect of the, um, the composite systems and the fact we know none of the rain screen test uh, systems passed? Was that also a surprise? Yes. Um, in terms of cavity barriers, we've touched on the fact that only two of the 14 systems tested included fire barriers, and, and you can't help us as to why that was, no? As I say, the... The, the systems that um, uh, contain, contain the barriers um, appear to have um, 
uh, not met the, the, the requirements. So it was um, looking at the most effective additional information we could gain um, right. around the programmes. Because we looked at it earlier, one of the stated objectives of this contract was to understand the contribution of any fire stopping present within the cladding system, yes? Do you remember it was at the top of the page? Yes. Um, but if we go back to the analysis report submitted to the department, this is at BRE 30041882, and to page three, paragraph seven of this executive summary, at the bottom of the page it says, the full-scale test was the only method which satisfactorily assessed the system performance, including detailing such as fire barriers. So that's one of the conclusions from this project, yes? Yes. How did the full-scale test method satisfactorily assess detailing such as fire barriers when only two of the full-scale tests actually contain cavity barriers? Because the systems that were actually tested with, with the barriers that failed, it was the failure mechanisms associated with the barriers that were actually um, raising the questions. But did you think that was a statistically significant enough data pool to reach that conclusion? Given the evidence and the statistical uh, pool that we had available to us, yes. You thought that was satisfactory, did you? It indicated that we could look at the performance of barriers as part of that process. And we did for two of them, and they showed that they were challenged by the fire test. Right. But... None of the intermediate or bench scale tests allowed the performance of cavity barriers to be assessed, did it? It doesn't allow for their influence no. to be impacted at all, no. Did you consider that the test programme as carried out was in fact capable of informing questions about the influence of cavity barriers in these tests? It allowed us to understand how the fire was propagating and to understand whether the, uh, the fire barriers were likely to have remained in place during the test. Now, did this tell you anything about the provisions which existed in the addition of approved, the approved document which was in force at the time? Those were the products used on the external surfaces of buildings with a story over 18 metres were, were to achieve class naught, yes? Sorry. I so... I'll put it another way. Given that you're saying in conclusion seven that the full-scale test method was the only method which satisfactorily assessed the system performance, including detailing such as fire barriers, how was the current version of approved document B satisfactory, given that that large-scale test was only there in a note and as an alternative to the provisions that we've seen set out, for example, in diagram 40? Um, I, 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 I apologise, I, I mis, may misunderstand, but um, 7 is saying that it was the only test method which allowed us to fully assess the fire performance of the system. Yes. It, that was the comment that was, was being drawn in 7? Yes, so wasn't that showing that there was a problem with approved document B? Because approved document B wasn't saying, was it, at this time, the only way you can assess, satisfactorily assess the system performance is with a full-scale fire test. It gave Fire Note 9 as an option, but it didn't say that was the only way you could assess fire performance of these systems, did it? No, it didn't. No. So it was flagging up a big problem with approved document B, yes? Yes, on the interme intermediate and bench scale tests now, um, were you present at any of those? Uh, I would have been present for some of them. If we look at the um, analysis report at page 11, now this analysis report, under the heading BS 476 part 6 and 7 at the top there, it tells us, the results from BS 476 Part 6 and 7 are presented in Table 2. The results from these tests were not as expected, with only four of the 11 products achieving Class 0. 
all the materials tested were believed to be class naught products when purchased for this product project. Um, now, can you help us with this? What was the basis for the BR, BRE's belief that these p p products were all national class naught when the products were purchased? Our understanding of the, um, the specification to the to the program was that they were class O um, products. Do you know? Um, did you ask your third party? Um, contractor who supplied these panels did you ask them to check that they were manufactured and mar uh, that they were marketed as class naught products yes yeah so it was not as expected um, that so many of them wouldn't in fact achieve national class naught when subjected to this testing correct if we look at table two on page 12 of this report, we can see the data that reflects that in the final column with yes and no, Y and N for whether or not they did or not. Um, apart from these uh, results being unexpected, um, didn't this tell you that one possibility was that seven out of the 11 companies were lying about their product classification? There was obviously a discrepancy, yes. Yes. So that was one possibility, wasn't it, that the, the manufacturers were simply lying about whether they'd met national class nord? Yeah, as I say, yes. The, if, if, the, if they place the product on the market as, as a class nord product. Yeah. Uh, one other potential explanation might be that there were potentially serious problems with reproducing test results to BS 476 part 6 and part 7, yes, that they weren't reliable. Was that ever considered? The, 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 two, the two possibilities are, as, as, as you say, a, te a test is a snapshot in time and therefore there is um, no control to know whether it was still manufactured to the same um, specification as it was at the time of test, or that they um, were unclear with the products that were being placed on the market. Yeah. Either of those possibilities would surely have been of serious concern to the BRE. Yes. If we look at page 19 and the first paragraph headed Class Nought, you've written in the re this report, the results from BS 476 Part 6 and 7 tests were expected to confirm the Class Nought performance of the products used in this project. As the results show, all the materials achieved the required performance levels in the fire propagation test, 476 Part 6, but a significant number did not achieve the required surface spread of flame classifications. There does not appear to be any one reason for this lack of performance. Now, can you help us? What, what, what were the list of reasons for this potential lack of performance? Uh, with the period, passage of time, no, I can't. I, I, I don't know what the, the differing performances were at that time. Was there any reaction to this from the department when this information was presented to them? No. Seven out of 11 products is a worrying number in terms of failing to meet the claimed reaction to fire classifications. Can we agree that? Yes. Did you have any reason to think that this situation might not be being replicated across the market? There, there is always, um, always a concern around a, a single point test report. Did you have any discussions with the department about the potential implications of these test results? Uh, in, in the context, in the wider context of test reports in isolation as opposed to Certification, that was an ongoing conversation that had been in place for, for many years. Help me with what you mean by that. Do, do you mean that... Um, the whole, the whole issue around a test report and its provenance in relation to the product as placed on market is one that has been um, recognised for, for a long period. I see. Do you mean that the department was well aware before this time that there was often a discrepancy between what manufacturers were marketing their product as achieving and what, in fact, the products achieved? The, the, the possibility for that existed, yes. But this is no longer a possibility, was it? Because you've got seven out of 11 products where mm. you've purchased it 
that's said to be class naught and you've proven with the test it doesn't satisfy it. So it's no longer a possibility, is it? No. No, I say that, that they are and were aware that that was um, an occurrence. Did you or anyone else at the BRE contact the manufacturers of these seven products in order to inform them that they hadn't met the 476 Part 6 and Part 7 test? No. Did you or anyone else at the BRE contact training, Trading Standards or the Advertising Standards Authority about these products? No. Why not? We had made the department aware at that point and allowing them to take the actions resulting from that. But did you understand that they were actually going to take any action? I believed they were, yes. And, and what did you believe they were going to do? I believed that they were going to review the position and take the actions that needed to be to, to follow up on the on the findings and the results from this. But, but but what does that mean? What did you actually think they were going to do about it? In terms of being able to do anything about the the actual results themselves, I don't know what course of action was available to them to under, to, to do that. Um, but in terms of the the wider implications and the regulations, then yes, they were aware of of what of the issues around using a test report and not a certified product were. Right, but do you think they were aware, specifically in relation to national class naught, that this product, uh, this problem uh, existed? From the findings of this report, yes. Right. Going back to the aluminium and the ACMPE panel, we know that one of the four products which did achieve class naught was the ACMPE that we've been discussing. If we go to page 11 of this report and the first paragraph under rain screen panels, it says the aluminium cladding panels achieved a class naught performance when tested to BS 476 part 6 and 7. Both their performance in the fire propagation test and the surface spread of flame test showed they fully met the requirements of this classification. Yes? Yes. Did that particular feature of the testing of this product surprise you, that it had fully met the National Class Nought uh, tests, but um, had performed so disastrously in the large-scale test? Yes. If we scroll down to page 14 and the last paragraph under the heading Rain Screen Panels... We can see it says there, the aluminium system generated high rates of fire growth and in both cases was extinguished early due to excessive temperatures and fire growth. This is reflected in the indicative classification of D, S2, D0. Do you see that? Yes. So in the, is this right, in the single burning item test that you did, you worked out that in terms of European classifications, that product would be getting a D, yes? That's correct. And on page 19, if we look at the penultimate paragraph on the page in relation to European reaction to fire performance, we can see a small paragraph that reads, the aluminium sheeting system achieved the poorest classification in both tests, although it was the only system to achieve class naught in the British standard tests. That's correct. Did these results suggest to you in very clear terms that it would be seriously irresponsible for anyone to continue to allow class naught to be used as a standard for assessing the fire performance on high-rise buildings? It, it wasn't, yes, it, it wasn't appropriate uh, as a single method of um, addressing it. Yes. It Were you aware that the product could be used on high-rise buildings in compliance with the provisions of approved document B at the time? My, my understanding, as I say, my interpretation was that it couldn't, but um, that, that was, um, and, and that was what was being addressed with the, the use of the, the, the test to confirm the, if, if these type of products were to be used, that they were, were to be tested. Right. We looked earlier at the 2000 version of Approved Document B together. Do you remember it was Section 13 of Approved Document B? What was it within that approved document that gave guidance that this kind of product could not be used? Do you recall? It wasn't um, lim uh, limited combustibility. But as we looked, it, it said that only insulation in ventilated cavities needed to be of lim limited combustibility. There was nothing saying 
your external panel needs to be of limited combustibility, was there in that guidance? As I say, I, I can provide the test evidence to enable these to move forward. I'm not, um, and I was not, working in, in terms of interpreting that in, in this environment. So the, the use of class O in isolation uh, is, or class not in isolation was not um, my, not my understanding of an appropriate method. Right. Did you consider at any stage of this project or thereafter recommending to government that the national reaction to fire classifications ought to be withdrawn from use completely in relation to the external wall of high-rise buildings? So in the conclusions to this report, we, we made clear that there was um, a difference that needed to be addressed. And um, on that basis and the evidence provided, my understanding was that they would review the guidance accordingly. Right. I've got some questions now about the BS British Standards Institute Joint Committee and the Industry Advisory Group. If we could go to BRE 3042045, -04 we can see that this is a document headed Generic Data Supporting the Revision of BR 135, yes? Yes. It was prepared for by the BRE for the Industry Advisory Group and the Joint Working Group of... BSI Technical Committees FSH 21 and FSH 22, yes? Yes. And if we look at pages one and two, we can see, unlike in other reports, the names of those who prepared and approved this document are not given. Um, can you help us with um, who was involved in writing this report? It would have been drafted by um, uh, myself or uh, one of my the colleagues in the, uh, working on the project. Yeah, and do you remember approving this report before it was released? Um, I've, yes, I remember checking. And was this report approved by the department before it was presented to the IAG and the, to the BSI Joint Committee? Yes, it would not have been released without their... <clears throat> and would that have been Anthony Bird who approved this? Yes. And we talked a little before about the role of the IAG. What was the role of the joint working group of the BSI committees in this project? What role did they have? Uh, again, there was the development of the British standard that was going on at that, that time, so it was to inform and support their uh, understanding of the, the data that was coming from the test. Right. And were you chair of that joint <coughs> committee working group at the time? Um, if this was prior to the publication of the first standard, then no. Following the publication of the um, part one, then yes. Right. And is it right that alongside this report, a draft of the second edition of BR 135 was provided to the Industry Advisory Group and the British Standard Joint Committee for their comment? Uh, yes, I, I believe they were. And we understand that thereafter, the second edition of BR135 was released more widely as part of the consultation on revisions to BR135. Yes. And we'll come back to that. Um, was this document, the generic data, um, released more widely as part of a consultation on the revisions to BR135? Can you help us with that? I don't believe it was. No. If we go to page two, we can see, oh, we've got it there, that the draft is marked commercial in confidence. Um, and it says it shouldn't be circulated, copied or referenced in any form. And if we go to page three, we can see a list of the systems tested. This lists only 10 of the 14 tests. The composite systems are omitted altogether. Why is that? Um. I believe this was in relation to the part one test. So it, it, it formed the, the first part of the testing scenarios, not the, the second part. I see. If we go on to page five, there's a table of the generic test data for the ventilated cavity and the rain screen systems. In this table on page five, the PE cord aluminium panels we've been discussing are item three under the heading ventilated cavity and they are simply referred to as aluminium, yes? Yes. And at page eight, we can see under system three, 
at the top of the page, they're just described as aluminium-based cladding panels, yes? Yes. Now, I think you agreed earlier that that description is misleading, yes? It, 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 it doesn't give the full description of the panel, no. No. Did it occur to you at the time that the description given, so this is going to industry and to the BSI Joint Committee, might lead a reader to conclude that the cladding described was pure aluminium? I didn't consider that at the time, no. But do you agree that in order to make any proper assessment or comparison of the performance of the systems, those reading the report would need to know that the aluminium-based panels in fact had a polyethylene core? The purpose of the data was to show the type of um, information and responses that were gained. It wasn't to talk about the types of systems that were being tested. Why not? This was talking about the test methodology. We weren't talking about identification of, of particular systems as part of that. Right. Were any members of the IAG other than government or the BSI Joint Committee actually told that these panels were ACM with a polyethylene core? Uh, I don't know. Forgive my asking, but if you're going to discuss the method, you don't need to have any information about the constituents of the test, do you? No. So it it's doesn't really make sense to say, well, this was any concern with the method. It was concerned with the method as it had been applied to certain specific products. Is that not right? It, it, was, it was to look at the, um, the type of data that was collected, whether it could differentiate between different types of materials and systems, mm -hmm. and whether those, how those were identified um, generically um, was the, the rationale behind the way the information was given. It wasn't given in terms of setting a particular type of product. We could have called them systems A, B, C, D, E. All right, thank you. But I think you told us earlier that the role of the IAG was to advise on the systems being tested, yes? So in that, in that regard, they would have been aware at the outset of, the, of the, the systems that were being tested, yes. Do you recall there being any discussion about how these panels were described in this document? No, I don't. I'd say it, at the time, um, there was no discussion around this. It was the data was presented. Everybody understood that those particular panels had performed very badly, and that was it, it was moved on from that. The, the reference at that time and, and the relationship of ACM was not one that was discussed. Did anyone um, raise any concerns about the performance of the aluminium-based product? Did anyone say, hang on a minute, if this is just aluminium, why is it performing like this? No. Let's move to the conclusions from the testing programme. Um, Mr Chairman, I'd be grateful if I can just finish this topic. Yes, it may right. take us just a couple of minutes over yeah, right, one o'clock. Keep but going. Um, so if we look at the conclusions and recommendations section of the report, go back to the, the analysis report, which is at BRE 3041882, and look at page 24. BRE 3041882, page 24. This, head, this is um, called Conclusions and Recommendations, and I'm interested in understanding why it doesn't appear that we have actually any solid recommendations in this section. Um, do, do you, were there recommendations set out in a, in a separate report? I mean, this appears to set out conclusions, but it doesn't actually contain any recommendations, as far as we can tell. Can you help us with that? Insofar as they, they set out the findings from, from the program, um, and therefore the, um, pre present that the um, small-scale tests um, did not identify the full-scale performance, then um, that, that would be the... the uh, recommendation from the from the process. I agree it's not written in, in one line. Right. If we go back to the closing report that was prepared for Anthony Bird at the OPDM, this is at BRE 3041895. We go to page 13. He 
Here we've got the conclusion and recommendations uh, in this report. And at paragraph five, we can read, it says, the aluminium sheet product satisfied class naught requirements, but in the full scale, intermediate scale and single burning item test proved to be one of the worst performing products. As the current guidance in approved document B asks for class naught performance in diagram 40, these issues may require further consideration. Do you see that? Yes. So that's it. That's all that's said. They may require further consideration. Um, how can that be right? Why isn't there a stronger recommendation coming from the BRE in the light of the test results and in the light of what's clearly understood about approved document B in that paragraph? Because that's the style in which those types of recommendations to the department are made. What does that mean? It, it means we flag this to you. You, you, you. you may wish to consider this further. Are you suggesting that you couldn't have made a stronger recommendation? No, no that, is the, that is the style in which those types of recommendation would have been made. Why? How that, do you know that? Because that's the type of statement that, and the style of those types of reports. It's, it's flagging that there was an issue and they may wish to consider that further. And, and, and where had you got that style from? Was that just house style? Was it just convention within the BRE? I think it was convention within the discussions between the department and the, um, uh, the group in terms of how this information was presented to them and how it was received. Did you ever find out whether the department was going to give that matter further consideration? Did you ever follow up on this? As I say, my, my understanding was that all of the information flowing from this piece of work was then being taken by the department to review where they were with this, their guidance on this. So it, it formed part of those, those ongoing discussions. Do you accept that this project demonstrated to you and to the BRE team more widely and to government that the national reaction to fire classification system in general and national class nought in particular was not able to detect the fire hazard associated with the use of some apparently common combustible rain screen cladding products. Yes. And that despite it being able to achieve a national class nought reaction to fire classification, PE called ACM presented a clear external fire spread hazard. Yes. A PE called aluminium rain screen cladding product was likely to present a very real danger with respect to external fire spread on high rise buildings. Yes. And fire safety compliance testing was either flawed or not reproducible, or technical loopholes were being exploited by manufacturers, or manufacturers were simply making false claims about fire safety. Yes? That the yeah that the wide that the wider use of the test reports was not always clear. Can you help us with this? The detailed reports and the data from this project have never, before this inquiry began, been released into the public domain. Why is that? The work was completed for the department, and it was for the department to decide how it was disseminated. Did the BRE ever give serious consideration to ensuring that this important information was disseminated to industry? This is one of many projects that are completed for, for industry, uh, for, for government, and it has always been that, that route through which dissemination has taken place. Did you ever give any consideration at any time before the Grenfell Tower fire to revisiting this test data or to a need to warn industry and others about the dangers in the use of ACMPE? I, I, gen, I genuinely under, understood the guidance to mean that it couldn't be used and it's only in the revisiting of this that I, I am being made aware that that was not how it was being interpreted. Yes. And it clearly wasn't being interpreted that way, as we can see by paragraph five on the page, yes? That 
in my opinion, full-scale testing is the only way to actually assess how these products behave. Well, no, because it says, as the current guidance in approved document B asks for class naught performance in diagram 40, these issues may require further consideration. And those issues are that the aluminium product is performing as one of the worst performing products, yes? It is one of the worst performing products, yes. yes. Mr Chairman, thank you for letting me go on slightly longer. That's quite right. Just help me with one small thing. Um, <clears throat> we've seen, we see reference in paragraph 5 here to aluminium sheet product, and we've seen references elsewhere to aluminium product. Uh, was the acronym ACM one that you were familiar with at this stage? No. You hadn't heard about it? No. But you had heard of PE cord composite panels? I was made aware of PE composite panels as part of this project. Right. So um, the, the, the use of the phrase ACM at, at that time was not one I was, I was familiar with. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, well, that's probably a good point to stop, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, we'll break at that point then, uh, Dr you. Colville. We'll resume at five past two, please. And again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence when they're out of the room. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Five past two, please.